Real Chat Episode 51, Batman Begins. To travel the world, now you must journey inwards. What you really fear is inside you. There is no turning back. Your parents' death was not your fault. The training is nothing. The will is everything. If you make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to an ideal, you become something else entirely. Are you ready to begin? The legend begins. Everybody, welcome to episode 51 and the 2016 return of Real Chat, a podcast that promises week in, week out, the real world as we know it. Many actors have donned the mask and cape and stepped in front of the camera to fight criminals in Gotham City, from Adam West to Michael Keaton to Val Kilmer to George Clooney. But it was the director-actor tandem of Christopher Nolan and Christian Bale that finally hit upon the true essence of Batman in their 2005 blockbuster that reset the series, Batman Begins, which tells the origin story of the title character from his alter ego Bruce Wayne's initial fear of bats, the death of his parents, his journey to become Batman, and his fight to stop Ral Al Ghul and the Scarecrow from plunging Gotham City into chaos. My name's Adam Stolfer. I'm welcoming all you loyal fans back to us after our short break. And joining me in the Batcave today is good friend and co-host, Bruce Savard. Bruce, welcome back. I, I feel like you should play the old 60s. Uh, <laughs> yes. After you introduce each of <laughs> Might us. Might put it in there, bro. Into the Batcave. Exciting news for 60s Batman fans. Lego are releasing the 60s Batcave Batmobile oh, helicopter yes. and minifigures. This year, 2016, is the year of the bat. It may not be. I don't know my Chinese uh, you know, horoscopes. I'd like to say hundreds of people have been begging me mercilessly over the break to find out when Real Chat was returning me to too, the podcast bros. airwaves. Only one person's asked me personally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've had more than one. You've had more than one? Yes, wow. I have. Was Helen one of them just trying to get you out of the house? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Where's true. Real Chat back? You're around so much at the moment. Mainly our panel members. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stu has been nagging me. When are we coming back? When are we coming back? When are we coming back? Indeed. But, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, I'm a little bit worried about how I'll go. I've, I've only just watched the film today, and uh, it's been a while since I've seen it, and I just don't know uh, after the, the break whether I can sit on my ass and talk into a microphone and give my opinion as if it matters anymore. We'll see. Maybe I've still got those skills. Maybe We're about to find out, Bryce. We're about, we're to, about find to find out. Find out. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is here? We have the return of the man himself, Mr. Andrew McCaskill. How are you, sir? Good. So dramatic. So dramatic. Oh, mate, but, we're back. Uh, Very excited. I just parked the car and got upstairs, and here I am. So it's nothing too full on, but uh, <laughs> it's good to be back. Good to be back. New year and uh, refreshed and uh, ready to go. Good to have you here, Andrew. And uh, returning as well for his second appearance here on Real Chat, uh, Bruce's brother, Roddy Avard. Rod, how's it going? It's going very well. Now, I know for a fact as well, Roddy, that you are a huge Batman fan, so... When uh, we were looking for the panel members for this episode, uh, you were a shoe in my friend, so... I'd like to hope so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, if by shoe in Adam means you were the third on our list. But uh, you're here. And <laughs> I'll I take think... it. That's fine. <laughs> that's, fine. <laughs> uh, that's, not, that's not true at all. Uh, so Rod's qualifications include how many... How far back do your Batman comics go now? 1968. Wow. 1968. Oh, yeah. how, many, how many issues? Oh, there's about... Because I've got Detective and Batman, because they're the first two he appeared in. I've got 40 issues to go over both of them, and I'll have every issue from November 68 to present day. And there's about 900 comics there. Wow. Are they in mint condition, Rod? Not all of them. Right. <laughs> a majority of them are. A majority, are, of, majority them are of them are in mint, and then nothing less than, say, fine or very fine. For those that are in the comic book collecting world, you know what that means? I've got about 3,000 all up. Batman comic, That's Batman incredible. Yeah. That's why I don't have um, a house. And uh, Rod is single, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> He's single. Uh, so check that out. You Bruce. find me on Tinder. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like Batman. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's Roddy on Tinder. A random fact that just came out that I had no idea about. Did you know that Melbourne, where we're all from here today, everybody, used to be called 
Batmania. Well, John Batman was the who yes. discovered Australia. He wanted to call it Batmania. Yes. And if it was called that, only for about three seconds. Uh, I know. But, but still, uh, yeah, we could have been living in Batmania. There is in the, I think it's in the northern suburbs, is it? Uh, Batman Park. Yep. Which is not, a, it's not a, it's not an adventure playground or anything. It's just a pretty boring kind of That's park. That's like Northgate Preston area. Yeah, it's around it? that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and Batman there's ba- Street. Batman Street just a few blocks from where I live as well. <laughs> Batman and, Street. Uh, <laughs> Batman Street, the, the sign, yeah. they just keep putting it up higher and higher, hoping people don't steal it but they don't understand that Batman fans can swoop in and steal it <laughs> from on top of a building <laughs> we're ninjas we jump that's right Batman <laughs> what fans a uh, ninjas. narcissistic bastard Batman must have oh, been though he, he let's was... call it Batmania <laughs> of course <laughs> For those interested in a, bit of, uh, me. in a bit of Melbourne history, uh, John Batman was one of the most narcissistic men in the history of Australia and died of syphilis. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you get. That's, That's what you get what hanging you out get. with bats. <laughs> Didn't learn that one in high school, did you? Bruce, this is a return of our Vintage Vault retrospective series this year. Conscious effort to time selected shows with something of relevance to the present. But this year, Bruce, it's all about Batman versus Superman, it seems. That is true. Yeah, is it all- really, though? Do you think we... Does anyone give a shit? I, I, I don't, <laughs> to be honest. But they I want you to. They, they certainly really do. do. Have you seen the trailers, Andrew? Or? I've seen one of them, and it was before Star Wars, and I just went, get on with Star Wars, you know, I'm so, okay. Yes, yeah, okay. So are you, you're not looking forward to this film at all? I, seriously, the, when they cast Ben Affleck as Batman, you just lost me straight away. It's really? Like, not a was, fan? It's just terrible casting in my But is there no comfort in the fact that Ben Affleck's not the guy that's going to stuff this film up because it's directed by Zack Snyder? <laughs> well, I think many people are going <laughs> like, to stuff this up. That's the thing. Like, where, where, do you, where do you point <laughs> yeah. your finger? Well, yeah. that's, well, that's okay, well, let me ask the Batman fan then. Uh, Roddy, what do you, well, how do you feel about about this movie, uh, knowing a lot about the comics and the origin of the character and everything. Are you excited? I'm not letting myself get excited. So when I see it, no matter what I see, okay, yeah, that was okay. Okay. If I go and go, oh, this is going to be awesome, this, I'm disappointment. So but I'm not. This this whole era where we're, we're having these versus movies yeah. as well. I mean, how many have there been now? Alien versus Predator, Freddy versus Jason. Uh, well, I'd, you know, you'd like to think this one's going to be better than those two. Oh, well, it wouldn't take much. <laughs> you'd, you'd like, yeah. I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I know. But I'm, Although I just, Batman versus Superman versus Freddy, eh? I'd watch that. Hey, where are the versus versus films? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> if it's a Freddy film, guaranteed boobies. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That, that classic 80s trope. Yes. <laughs> I'm also, on a personal, I'm also sick of Superman versus Batman. I've read it far too many times. And a massive Batman fan, if Superman came out of the blue for no reason, he's not beating Batman. Right. But Superman doesn't do that because Superman's really good. Batman's the one that'll come out of nowhere and give him a sucker punch. Uh, don't, don't they just end up being buddies? Oh, it's a misunderstanding. We hate each other. Oh, no, you're a good guy too. Let's be pals. Wow. Sorry well, about that. Yeah, sorry about that, Chuck. <laughs> oh, we just destroyed half of our cities. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody who's spoken to me about the film as well says the same thing. They're like, wouldn't Superman just wipe the floor with Batman? Because one's an alien, one's a human. In a fair fight, no. Because Batman doesn't fight fair because he doesn't, he can't. And I, I kind of like that bit. But... Ultimately, yes. If Superman was angry or whatever, then yes, Superman is more powerful. It's just the yeah. way it is. Yeah. I'm just going to use this this film, Batman Begins, that we're looking at today as an example. My favourite thing about this movie is this is the most realistic Batman film that we're going to get in regards to a film about a guy who dresses up as a bat and fights crime. This film is the most realistic take on a superhero you know, subject. This, this film goes to great lengths to establish a, a tangible reality as well, which is what I like. The little things yeah. like Alfred being involved with ordering the elements of the Batman suit, you know, things going wrong, ordering in mass quantities. Yeah, Lucius Fox, brilliant inclusion in this script yeah. to justify how... Bruce Wayne ended up with all this gear and that's one of the things that I responded to the first time I saw it is and the X-Men films did a great job of it as well and and it's one of the things that superhero films are moving away from is spending that time just to establish that reality that we can grab onto and yeah you're right this film nails it yeah I mean this blew my mind growing up with Rod obviously I grew up with a Batman fan in the house and Everyone knows whatever your siblings are into, that's what you get into to a lesser degree. So, you know, we watched the 60s Batman series, we watched the 60s film, we watched the Tim Burton films. Rod's ninth birthday, was it? Was a trip to uh, Kringle Cinemas to see Batman? I can't remember now. To see the Tim first Tim Burton Batman film. And, of course, I've, I've read some of the, the ongoing storylines, the Nightfall storyline from the Batman comics, which is phenomenal, uh, a little bit of No Man's Land, some of the other stuff in between. So I know a little bit about the Batman universe, and then you sit through this film, and as a Batman fan... 
it just blows your mind. Like if those things, those little elements that they put together that, you know, the idea that the bat cave is connected to the house because it was used during the, the civil war and like all these little, and they're only little tiny things and they don't really matter to a big blockbuster film. You don't need to mention these things, but they do. And it, and it gives that extra layer of reality that, you, that, that helps it a lot easier to, you know, maybe a billionaire does roam around the city as a bat. Yeah. yeah. And what about yourself, uh, Andrew? What are some of your initial thoughts on uh, this reboot? Yeah, I, I, th- I just think it's it's just a really solid interpretation of these films. I mean, to come back from the travesty of Batman and Robin, you know, like that. I mean, obviously, there's some years in between them and they needed to be. But um, it's just the pressure that would have been on them to, to kind of, you know, start again and, and rebuild was just huge. And, you know, to take a chance on Christopher Nolan, who was kind of, you know, wasn't a given, you know, he was He's, he's just finding his feet as a filmmaker and had a few good, in, strong indie films. He had a few hits by this stage, yeah. But like a major blockbuster like this uh, just shows you that, you know, if, if they put more faith in talented filmmakers out there, then you can get results like Batman Begins, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I think one of the issues that Marvel are going to run into, and they're going to run into it sooner rather than later, is they're so willing to brand one person to be the authority on, on, a, on the comic book film genre for them, and they're not letting the artists who come in they're not allowing them to make the film they want to make. And I think uh, Favreau probably got a lot more Favreau into Iron Man 1 than he would now. Uh, I think uh, Raimi in the first Spider-Man film at least yep. got a lot more Raimi in there than he probably would now. And they were going after these amazing directors to make these kind of cult films and made them into these amazing blockbusters. But now they've kind of flipped back the other way and you keep hearing stories about directors who get told what to do the whole way through making a film. And I understand when they're trying to tie it into the outside universe, you need to do that, but just let a director direct a bloody film. Because once they're a huge success, then it just gets tighter and tighter. Yeah, they just lock it down and, and it's just the pressure builds and they just don't want to make any kind of, ooh, let's not take any risks. So it was interesting at Marvel because there was a board involved in making creative decisions who they, they were above uh, Feig. So Kevin Feig is kind of the uh, top guy at Marvel Film, but Marvel Comics kind of were overseeing him for a long time, and he's just got through a process where he's eliminated that extra governance above him, and he's now the top guy. A lot of people are seeing that as a good thing, and hopefully all the negatives we've seen in Marvel Films will disappear, but it's also a dangerous thing to have one man in charge of all those films. So to be very curious. That being said, letting Nolan be Nolan with these films, for better or worse in the whole trilogy, I think, it gets to the point where Nolan circles back around and does himself an injustice. But, I mean, letting Nolan be Nolan. Let the director be yeah. the director. No, agreed. Yeah. What about yourself, Roddy, as the big Batman fan? What do you think? What are your initial thoughts on this take? When it first came out, I was following it on the internet and whatnot, and I was just pumped. This was going to bring the comic book Batman to the big screen for real, believably, seriously. And I thought this was just going to be awesome. I watched it and it was. Just all the homages or the complete copies from what we've seen in the comic books. Yeah, this this film does have a lot of those little nods, but none of them are in your face. No, no, it's just nice yeah, and subtle. They're, they're buried in there yeah, really nicely. That's, um, yeah, I like that too. There's a little bit in this film, but that's one of the other things he taught himself to do is become this amazing detective and an incredible sleuth. And that's one of the strengths he has against Superman in that environment, but it's never shown in the films. No. Andrew, you'll love this. Uh, before the shooting began, director Christopher Nolan invited the whole film crew to a private screening of one of your favourite films, Blade Runner. After the film, he said to the whole crew... This is how we're going to make Batman. So what are some of your thoughts on that comment? Yeah, I saw that. And his technique there. I, I mean, at first I couldn't, I couldn't really see the relation in the finished product. But I guess looking at the production design and how, what, why he did that, uh, I could see what the results. Because he was talking about production design and creating this city that never had uh, an edge to it. It was just this completely engulfing world, uh, which is totally believable. And he certainly achieved that, I think. You, you get a sense of place with Batman Begins. You get a sense of Gotham... And and it's a completely fictional city, uh, which has its own rules and, and uh, restrictions. So, yeah, I think from that point of view, uh, it certainly captured that. Yeah, there was a moment, I, I didn't know about that, but uh, there was a moment in the film where they're in the uh, Narrows and it's raining and it's kind of a little bit of a... Sh- and it, it reminded me of a Blade Runner shot. I mean, any shot in the rain reminds you of Blade Runner, I guess, but... Either that or a uh, John Cusack film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was no telephone booth or anything around that <laughs> and there was no stereo being held up. The... Um, <laughs> but yeah, there was, there was one shot that really reminded me, and of course, Rod just pointed out to me, um, Rooker Howard, isn't it? So yeah, that's true, um, and a bad guy, like, and he's a bad guy, but yeah. he's not. I don't think he's a replicant. Don't no. think he is in this. Yeah. Wasn't it enough to find out? 
But yeah, I did definitely got a bit of a, a Blade Runner tone at times from this film, yeah. Batman Begins focuses on the darkest side of society and one man's drive to fight evil without compromise. True to his comic book roots, uh, Roddy, the Bruce Wayne of Batman Begins is motivated more by revenge than by justice and learns important lessons from his faithful guardian, Alfred, criminal prosecutor, Rachel Dawes, and his mysterious martial arts trainer, Henry Descartes. Uh, so yeah, do you think that the version of Batman represented here in this film is the closest to the comics? So far, yeah. yes. Yep. It, um, and do you think that's a good decision? Yeah, because Batman's human, so he's fallible. So he wasn't... That's another thing that not so much the Batman books do, but if it's JLA or if it's a team, another team book or a team-up book or whatever, Batman is infallible and he's always nine steps ahead of everyone and he nev- he's never wrong, where I kind of go, well, he's human, he's wrong, like... And there's no nothing wrong with him being wrong because that's when he has his plan B if something doesn't go right. Not plan B because he didn't think aliens were going to come down, but they did. So yeah. he had that. Like, it well, keeps it real. Yeah, I, I well, I think this is the uh, the representation of Batman where I, I felt the character the most. Mm. You know? Especially when... You identify with him the most. Yeah, especially if you're showing him coming up from college onwards where he's not Batman. So he can't be right. So you've got to show him learning. And that's how there's a lot of good Batman origin stories that have come through the years, and they're the well, they're the ones I enjoy, the ones where they actually show you climb the Tibetan mountain and learn how to all the different martial arts or goes to Europe. Yeah, I think all the uh, all the Bruce Wayne stuff in the prison and in, in the Tibetan mountains, it's, it's incredible. It's I mean, that's the big problem with cynics when it comes to Batman is how does this guy become Batman? But in the comic books, they go through it, they detail it. it it's, it's all there, and sometimes it's in flashbacks in other, in other issues or it's in an origin book, and this film really nails it. And so you do get a sense when he starts jumping around the city in different versions of the Batman suit to start with, okay, this is... This is tangible. This actually could work. So Batman Begins is a Warner Brothers sin copy in DC Comics release. It was released on the 15th of June, 2005 in the US and the day after, the 16th of June, 2005 in Australia, bro. So that's a real wow. sign of the times there. Bang, bang. Shot primarily in England and the UK, but also in Chicago in the US and Iceland as well, which is interesting. The budget was an estimated $150 million, but the film's marketing costs were $100 million, bro. Wow. Which were at the time the most ever spent on a single film. Yeah, and that is a lot of that is digging up, or digging, digging, uh, trying to fill in the holes that Schumacher dug, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So a lot of that is trying to reinstate the, the Batman ethos and, and character from that terrible Batman and Robin film, uh, that terrible Batman and Robin film, which um, still made money, by the way. It really did, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's kind of... Not as much, but... I remember, uh, um, I remember when this film came out, and it didn't have... Like, I mean, you think of, like, The Force Awakens, just the extreme anticipation of something like that. I don't remember it being that for this. I remember like maybe people were so burned by Batman and no, Robin. I think you're. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's exactly what was going on. It's, I think people it, were it, like, "Wait a minute, you got to impress me before I go and see this one." And it was it was kind of sold. I remember it was marketed as like the cerebral Batman, you know, film. Like it was kind of like the thinking man's take on it. The thinking Batman's Batman. That's it. Yeah. That's exactly what they said. <laughs> and, um, yeah, like so. I remember, you know, when I was going in, I was thinking this is going to be a really different approach to the film, and and I don't know, it, it, the excitement factor wasn't huge. I remember that so the marketing was it worth it <laughs> 100 million well <laughs> against you know, from my personal opinion after yeah. batman and robin warner brothers made a statement which is big and bold in the first place to say the batman character had been retired yeah not permanently but for batman fans that were waiting for the fourth film in that or the fifth film in that series or a reboot they just came out and said uh-uh, no more batman and yep. it was how many years between Batman and Robin and eight years. Yeah, there you go. Eight, sorry. Yeah. Um, and the film came a lot sooner than I was expecting, so I was excited about that, definitely. We'll speak about this when we look at The Dark Knight a little bit more, bros, uh, but uh, mainly because The Dark Knight made so much more. But this film made $374.2 million worldwide. Wow. Not mind-blowingly amazing, but, you know, still what you'd qualify as a hit. So, uh, that is absolutely a hit, no question. Yeah. yeah. So the title of the film went through many changes. First it was known as Batman 5, then it became Batman the Frightening for a little while, and to prevent script leaks, they were titled Intimidation Game to throw off the public. Before Christopher Nolan took over, director Darren Aronofsky Bruce, oh, was wow. attached to make a Batman movie based on the graphic novel Batman Year One. Now, you would have read this one, right, Roddy? Oh, uh, yep, yep, yeah, yep. Do you like it? it? Yeah, 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 you yeah, it? Yep. yeah, love it. And also have the author Frank Miller write the screenplay. So by 2003, there was a first draft screenplay with storyboards, which are the properties of AOL Time Warner. Wow. 
So, uh, and then those companies separated, I yeah, guess. Yeah, and there were, uh, from the stories I've heard as well, there were a number of different Batman projects in place after Batman and Robin before Batman begins over those eight years. Wow. Obviously, none of them came to fruition, but they didn't want to let go of it. That's for sure. They knew that they had, you know... Well, they made a heap of money off those films, yeah. so... Yeah. yeah. Wow. And so, kids so. love Batman. But, of course, despite the film's darkness, you know, the finished film I'm talking about here, Nolan wanted to make the film appeal to a wide age range, of course. He says, or he's quoted as saying, not the youngest kids, obviously. I think what we've done is probably a bit intense for them, but I certainly didn't want to exclude the 10 to 12-year-olds because as a kid, I would have loved to have seen a movie like this. Um, because of this, nothing gory or bloody is really featured yeah. in the film either. So. And I think that suits Batman. I think so. Oh, yeah. yeah well, the comic too. books aren't gory or bloody. No. By any means. No. Now, this film, this is the first Nolan film we've looked at a real chat, bro. So true, yeah. The director is Christopher Nolan. So, Christopher Jonathan James Nolan is an English American film director, screenwriter, and producer. He's one of the highest grossing directors in history and among the most successful and acclaimed filmmakers of the 21st century. Having made his directorial debut with Following in 1998, Nolan gained considerable attention for his second feature, Memento, in 2000. The acclaim of these independent films gave Nolan the opportunity to make the big-budget thriller Insomnia in 2002 and the mystery drama The Prestige in 2006. He found further popular and critical success with the Dark Knight trilogy between 2005-2012, Inception in 2010, and Interstellar in 2014. His nine films have grossed over $4.2 billion worldwide wow. and garnered a total of 26 Oscar nominations. And seven awards. Nolan has co-written several of his films with his brother, Jonathan Nolan, and runs the production company Sin Copying Inc. with his wife, Emma Thomas. Nolan's films are rooted in philosophical, sociological, and ethical concepts, exploring human morality, the construction of time, and the malleable nature of memory and personal identity. His body of work is permeated by metafictive elements, temporal shifts, non-linear storytelling, and practical special effects. He is also noted for his film noir influence aesthetics and for shooting on film as opposed to digital photography. So would you classify yourself as a Nolan fan, Andrew? And are you a fan of his work? Um, in patches. In patches, yeah. yeah. I, I do find him a bit serious. A yeah. bit of a serious filmmaker. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I do have issues with in the context of the Batman films. I, I feel that that sometimes gets a bit draining and it doesn't quite fit sometimes with the the films so i i really admire him as a filmmaker i just think you know specifically this film really uh, and D dark knight are really just there's some beautiful moments like the, the pinnacle of his what i've seen so far of his films you're a fan of memento as well or not so much i mean uh, you know i i appreciate it like i guess with all of these films i appreciate them i don't watch them often i don't throw them on because they're yeah, they not are, those they're kinds hard, of films hard regular viewing films aren't they they're, you know really heavy if you're sitting around with something to watch it's hard to pick up inception for instance which when i saw the first time i thought oh, i'll watch that again so i can work it out a bit more and I haven't got back to it. Like it's, I've got it on no, Blu-ray. I just haven't. And it's, it's you work. feel like you're, uh, I don't know, uh, being a cop out because you're saying, oh, it's just, it's a bit too intellectual. It's a bit too challenging on the on the grey matter. But sometimes you just want to be fucking entertained. And, and agreed. <laughs> and agreed. I think he, you know, he, he does films like a thesis. Sometimes they're just yeah. these really dense themes and heavy handedness going on, and you're just kind of like, Christ, man, just just make an explosion happen or something. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, Michael, be this shit, man? <laughs> Seriously, couldn't have put that better myself, though, Andrew. And Interstellar, that was a tough watch as well. Um, I, not that I dislike the film, I just, you know, I don't really want to see it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed every one of his films that I've seen. I've seen probably half or more of what he's done. But yeah, they're, they're, they're spot on. They're just, it's tough work. So do you classify yourself as a Nolan Van Bros or...? I can't argue that he's not a great director, but that doesn't mean he's always great viewing. Yeah. So, well, in terms of repeat viewing. So, yeah, I, I, th I think he's great. I wouldn't say I'm a fan, although I've got a few of his films on. What about yourself, Roddy? Right? I'm a big fan of Nolan Batman. Yeah, like everyone else at the table, repeat viewing, it's, it's really hard. Batman, even his Batman films, I've seen them all, I love them all. But, yeah, I don't chuck them on if I want to sit and enjoy a movie. It's just a filmmaking thing here as well, Andrew. Um, Nolan decided that there would be no second unit, which is something that he does, apparently. is one of his trademarks. So uh, for the whole 
129 shooting days of this film, Nolan oversaw every shot of the film personally. <laughs> yeah. You and know, apparently so. inserts as well. They, they shoot the inserts themselves. You know, like, you he's know. just, he's, he's really got, you know, his paws all over it, hasn't he? Yeah. Every I mean, he's, he's a classic. He's, he's like a, a filmmaker from a different time, I reckon. Yeah, he's got an element of Kubrick to him is, is how far I would go. Like, he's got that much control over the, the visual in terms of the, the, the camera and the shots and the compositions. And then the story as well. Like, it, it's really rare. I mean, I guess it's Tarantino's the only other guy in Hollywood you could put him up against in terms yeah. of that control. But... It's hard. There's not a lot of directors like him anymore. And you wouldn't get him to do a comedy, would you? God, you hope not. No. Yeah. <laughs> There's a dry, that's for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just quickly on that then, Batman Begins does have little little moments of humour, mainly probably just trying to break up all the seriousness. Yeah. Do you think that they work? I don't think they do so much. Yeah? yeah I, I think they're a little bit, little bit goofy, a little bit kind of, I don't know, like... Almost aimed at twelve-year-old kids or something like that. It just has that kind of, you know, vibe about it. Like they yeah. just, I don't know. Like they're kind of nice. They, they do break up that tension a bit, which is necessary. Seems but Gary Oldman got a lot of those lines as well. In yeah, this Gary. Film, but, and, uh, and the one in particular that jars for me is the um, when the the Batmobile takes off for the first time, and Oldman's there going, "Oh, I've got to get me one of those." I'm like, it doesn't even make sense. Yeah, that, that's awkward. Yeah, what's Gary yeah, Oldman? Yeah. Gonna, or what's um, Commissioner Gordon or Lieutenant Gordon going to do with the bloody yeah tumbler? And okay. the uh, the homeless guy just appearing out of nowhere. When when he first appears, yeah. and it's like nice coat, and it's just like it's that's almost like a bizarre okay. sketch. The, uh, yeah. for, for me, the lighter moments are more those little uh, revenge moments, I guess. You know, the Lucius Fox moment with, uh, uh, with yeah. the guy Luke Rutger Howe's character, and those little moments Earl. are like yeah. Earl, Earl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. did you get the memo? And that stuff, kind of stuff's like... the more satisfying. It's not humorous, but they're the lighter moments, whereas the comedy bits are a bit forced. What so, about uh, Christian Bale's? So, what do you think? Does it come in black? Yeah, that's like, nice. I like that. I think that's a tasty line. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's some good moments like that. Like uh, mainly Christian, but I think Christian Bell, you know, his take is fantastic, and his Bruce Wayne is amazing. I was going to say, you know, I have a uh, Andrew McCaskill moment in this film. I think it just goes back to when you back in the days of American Psycho, when Christian Bale was sort of you know being introduced, I guess. And I remember you really enjoyed that film when you saw it back in high school. It would have been '98. I think. Uh, no, I think that was like, that was 2000, that one. Yeah. And a bit of, um, what's the name of the character in American Psycho? Patrick Bateman. Patrick Bateman. There's a little bit of Patrick Bateman in oh, the scene. Absolutely. In the scene in this film in particular, where he goes into his own party and essentially tells them they're all like, you know, free like, loaders. Uh, free loaders out. <laughs> like, he tells them all to leave. Everybody. I, uh,. I want to thank you all for coming here tonight and drinking all of my booze. <laughs> no, really. Uh, there's a thing about being a Wayne that you're never short of a few freeloaders like yourselves to fill up your mansion with. So here's to you people. Thank you. That's enough. Uh, well, I'm not finished. To all of you, uh, all you phonies, all of you... <laughs> Two-faced friends, you sycophantic suck-ups who smile through your teeth at me, please leave me in peace. Please go. Stop smiling. It's not a joke. Please leave. The party's over. Get out. Oh, it's you know, a fantastic scene. Yeah. yeah. Just, so. it, just the way he kicks them out. Just, you sycophants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. But um, in regards to the writers, bro, um, obviously Bob Kane, uh, creator of Batman, gets the uh, character's credit. Well, the, technically the creator of Batman, but anyway. And the screenwriting credits go to David Samuel Goya. Mm. who's an American screenwriter, film director, novelist, and comic book writer, bros. His screenwriting works include the Blade trilogy, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, of course, Dark City and Man of Steel, and he directed four feature films, Zigzag, Blade Trinity, The Invisible, and The Unborn. And he was also the co-writer of the video games Call of Duty Black Ops 1 and 2. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, so, it's a hell of a career. So, yeah, the script was written by David Goya in the seven weeks before he was due to direct Blade Trinity, which he also wrote, which I just mentioned. Um, and then Nolan took over the writing chores after that, and Nolan gets the screenplay credit along with Goya. But uh, Nolan's brother didn't write on this one. He Not wrote, this one. But he did on the second and I third. I think it comes in Dark yeah, okay. Knight. That's yeah. cool. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, so what do you guys think of this script? I think it's a great script. I think it's really yeah. tight. I think it's nice and intricate. I guess... It's, it's almost uh, Bob Gale moments of uh, set up in the first act, pay off in the third. Bob which Gale's is the writer of which film, bro? Uh, Bob Gale wrote um, 
He's only ever really written three films. Um, back oh, it was to Back the, to the Future. Back to the Future. Yeah. Future. yeah. yeah. He yeah. also wrote the first arc of the Batman No Man's Land storyline that went from... Oh, there you go. There's a Bob Gale oh, Batman connection. To... Well, there's a connection. Nice. Yeah, not just structurally. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I felt it more watching it this time than I ever have before, but there are some great payoffs. Even just Raja Ghul, Ducard stuff, uh, the, the setup of uh, the way uh, Bruce Wayne's dad built the train with the water running through it. I mean, that all seems like it doesn't mean anything. And then, obviously, the way they're releasing the, the gas, the, evapor- the evaporated water, the, the steam and stuff, that design structure is integral to that plan. And I just really love those payoffs. And I think it, it, it's the sign of a well-crafted script. Yeah. You can write a script that tells you a story, but then if you can go back and put in those extra details and those extra payoffs, then it just makes that script that much better. It's just a great script. Yeah, Goya said that the goal of the film was to get the audience to care for both Batman and Bruce Wayne. And Nolan felt that the previous films were exercises in style rather than drama and described his inspiration as being good old Richard Donner's 1978 film Superman yeah. uh, in its focus on depicting the character's growth. And also similar to Superman, Nolan wanted an all-star supporting cast for Batman Begins to lend a sort of a more epic uh, or more credibility to the, uh, to the story. It's a fairly standard thing in most superhero films now, and I'm a bit cynical about it, that idea that whatever superhero films being made you get some experienced senior actor to play a key role and it lends the whole film credibility you know the first iron man had uh, bridges in it and ant-man has uh, douglas in it and like every time you watch one of these films you got uh, gary shandling pops up in one of the x-men films i think as a politician or one of yeah. those films every time you see one of these older senior kind of actors you kind of feel more comfortable and relaxed and helps you buy into that universe a bit more but the fact that you know rutger hauer morgan freeman michael kane like the senior actors, these great, uh, even someone like Ken Watanabe and, and um, uh, Gary Oldman, Gary Oldman, like how rich is the texture of this film? Yeah, it's yeah. an incredible cast, really. Right it's down like, to Tom Wilkinson, yeah, and Carmine Falcone, who's yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's brilliant, an Italian mobster. Yeah, but let's get Tom Wilkinson. Just we before we get to the cast, though, guys, we we're just we will get into them in a little bit more detail. But the cinematographer with this great name, uh, Wally Fister. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We've, have we encountered Wally Fister before? Uh, no. We haven't. You know, the funniest thing about this guy as well is the type of films that he worked on before Batman Begins. Uh, what can you tell us, uh, <laughs> Andrew? You, why don't you cross to me for that? Uh, uh, because we always cross to you. Is the, the uh, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I saw this written down somewhere. When with Wally Fister, don't leave him with your sister. Is that... <laughs> is that... Is that this Wally Fister or... I said, well, it sounds like a bad punchline yeah, in a limerick, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> what can you tell us, Andrew? Well, uh, yes, he's um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he did start out in some fairly, uh, well, shall we say, soft-focused uh, material. Yes, yes. Uh, the Inside Out trilogy. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, Inside Out trilogy is uh, what it, one of his. Not to uh, be confused with the recent Pixar. Film, not to right? be confused, you'd be very disappointed <laughs> if you were expecting uh, cute little animated figures, but or pleasantly surprised. Which well, you look at depends it. if if dad. Uh, alone at home, um, <laughs> and then there's another title, Night Rhythms, as well, which which you know you can only picture what that uh, embraces. Um, but and he's come a long way. You got to give him credit because he's you know started off in, oh. on some fairly you know subpar quality productions. Not that I've seen them, but um, and then he's moved on to basically one of the A grade guys of uh, of the industry. Yeah, so this film looks incredible. It looks stunning, yeah. and, and they get better and better as they as they go on yeah. as well. But this you know it's got its own look to it. It's got you know, a lot of kind of reds and oranges and, you know, like that kind of urban uh, lighting everywhere it has that kind of grun- grungy look to it's it. It's probably the brownest looking Batman film. It, it is very Earth. brown and I'm sure we'll get to it at some point, but the CGI work on the Narrows, I think, lets this film down a lot. I think the colour palette they used is, is lets them down a lot. But visually, like from the snow sequences to the, the gritty kind of grey prison sequences at the start, and which he uses again in the second Batman film. Yeah, beautiful. Incredible. And just the texture of the film, you know. Yeah. Just that, and it has such a grand scale, the way it's framed. And uh, yeah, it has a real cinematic, classic storytelling quality to it. Yeah. Um, what did he shoot on? He shot on... Um, is IMAX any of this IMAX or is yes. that the next one? Oh, no, no, this no, is an IMAX. I think that's the next one. The next, the next one, one has the select scenes. Select sequences, yeah. yeah. It, it's beautifully shot, yeah. 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 Apparently as well, the uh, that sort of daylight effect uh, coming through the windows of the Wayne Manor, uh, it was created by a single 100,000-watt floodlight 
which weighed nearly 400 pounds <laughs> right. uh, to create that like you know that, that look you know how like any time you're in the Wayne Manor it has a particular look like yeah. that sort of morning sort of sunlight sort of feel they need to dust that place they just uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, there's so much so many particles in the air and... <laughs> yeah <laughs> There's so, only one butler. That's a big. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, he's, he's, he's not young. Break. He's not he's a young not butler. Young. So, Bruce, does the cast of uh, Batman Begins qualify as being an iconic cast? Oh, good lord! It's full of a lot of iconic actors. But, yeah, well, uh, I guess it's an iconic cast. I mean, it's it's a hard question for me to answer, just because the performances are just so good. Iconic makes it seem more gives it. Oh, I don't know. Gives it a different texture. It almost under undervalues yeah, I'd the, agree with that. Under, undervalues yeah. the performances. Yeah. Like, but you wouldn't look at a great drama and describe that necessarily as like an iconic cast. And like, this film lends itself to that, I think. Whereas if you look at a superhero film or an action film or a, I don't know, is that does that makes sense? Yeah, it that's, does. Is that, that's not just cinema snobbery on my no, part. No, 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 no. I understand what you're saying for yeah. sure. Well, let's start with Christian Bale, who plays Bruce Wayne Dash, Batman, a billionaire socialite who witnesses his parents' deaths at the hands of a mugger when he is eight years old, and later travels the world for seven years to seek the means to fight injustice before returning to Gotham City, becoming its Batmast vigilante protector at night. And apparently um, David S. Goya, uh, the screenwriter, uh, mentioned in an interview that his favourite pre-audition choice for Batman wasn't actually Bale, it was Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, right. Who almost became Spider-Man. He was actually won over by Christian Bale after seeing his screen test. Wow. So, um, yeah, I was trying to envision this film with... uh, You have to assume Nolan had... Bale in mind for a while though because they'd worked together before or not at this point no first oh, they time. hadn't first oh, okay. time. This, is, this is the first time I think time, there yeah. was a real fan push for, for Christian Bale there was real forum kind of action that he should be the man yeah. what had Bale done of note besides American Psycho up to this it was, point I think American Psycho okay. was what sold it I mean sure. I, I think he was uh, he'd just done The Machinist before this and he was like rake thin yeah, um, yeah, so, so yeah, I think it was American Psycho, which just sold the whole Bruce Wayne. He has to nail three sides of, of that character. He has to be Bruce Wayne, the playboy, Bruce Wayne, the, the real man, the, the troubled soul, and, uh, and Batman. So it's a bloody hard thing to pull off. And he gives it charisma. He gives it uh, a sense of tragedy and, um, and fear as well. When he becomes, becomes Batman, he, he really brings everything to that. What about yourself, Bruce? Oh, look, I think he's phenomenal in this. Uh, I do remember when um, American Psycho came out, I went and saw it with Darren Chow, uh, who I do oh, yes. TV stuff with occasionally. We walked out of that film and Darren turned to me and said, Christian Bale should be the next Batman. Oh, wow. Yeah. Out of nowhere. And I'm like, oh, I don't Whatever. Okay. Like, we just got over George Clooney, for Christ's this, sake. And this would have been seven years before. Yeah, seven years before Batman came out. Yeah, right. And he's like, that, that's the guy. That's the next Batman. Yeah. And then seven years later, that popped back in my head, and I'm like, you bastard. You were spot on there. <laughs> Not only should he be, he was. And he's phenomenal. He's great. And he... One of the I mean, one of the great things is in the early scenes when he's supposed to look a lot younger, he does look really young. Like they grow, have his hair grown out and over his face, and he looks, you know, twenty twenty one or whatever. He's great in the fight sequences. He busts his ass, this guy. Like he's what an actor. He bulked up out of nowhere. How skinny was he in the Machinist? He, he came in and, and attacked this character not as a not as a uh, two dimensional character, but he actually gave it some depth. I mean, I, I think Michael Keaton did that as well, but uh, Clooney and, and Kilmer definitely were just playing a comic book character by those films. So good on him to have the balls to come here and, and recreate this character from pretty much nothing. And what about yourself, Roddy, as the big Batman fan? I Yep. Yeah, again, from now on, as of now, he is my favourite favorite Batman. He is Batman for me, for all the reasons that were said just then. For me, Michael Keaton and Christian Bale are my two number one and two for Batman. Both could equally do the Joker. So I'm thinking they to be able to do a Batman, you've got to be able to do a Joker. Yeah, I agree with that. That makes sense. Um, you, Michael not, Keaton, just watching Beetlejuice, that is yeah, the Joker. See you later. Thank you very um, much. You know, the the scene the in the 89 Batman where he confronts the Joker in Vicky, uh, Vicky Vale's apartment with the serving tray. You yeah, want to yeah. get nuts, let's get nuts. That's the Joker. Yeah. And you watch American Psycho, that is the Joker, plays the bad guy in Samuel L. Jackson's Shaft. Yep. So he can do evil. A couple of little things about Bale here as well. Um, he's, he had an active dislike of his uncomfortable Batman outfit, which he said helped his performance as the Dark Knight, as he was perpetually in a foul mood when wearing it. <laughs> you can imagine that with yeah. certain clips oh, that have yeah. been... Uh, Does that explain the voice? Yes. I reckon it pitched his nose. Of the voice, which we will get into as well, um, he lost it during filming after altering his voice every time he had to speak as Batman. 
And that doesn't surprise me. The uh, sequence at the end of the film when he's in the limousine coming into, I assume, Wayne Tower or whatever, and he's talking to Rutger Hauer on the speakerphone, he sounds awful. So, And I don't even know why they haven't redubbed it. Or maybe they redubbed it and he, okay, his well, voice was shot let, then. But. Let's, let's talk about it now. I have got, I was I had a spot for it later, but let's, let's talk about it now, considering we're talking about Bale. Um, what are your opinions of the so-called Batman voice? Uh, maybe not just in this film, but just in general. Uh, I think it, it is a bit awkward. I mean, yeah. but at the same time, he has to because like, if he just speaks normally, it just sounds, it would be ridiculous. Well, Roddy said that the character has always spoken differently as Bruce Wayne yeah. and Batman, even in all and the And that's where Keaton the, yeah, nails right? it. You know, Keaton, yeah, Keaton got it right. But even in the comic books, the secondary characters always, oh, well, not always, but every so often they'll throw the jibes in that they'll just go, oh, and he puts on that spooky voice. Because, yeah, when I read it, it's just Batman. Yeah, and if yeah. I read Bruce Wayne, it's just Bruce. Like, so it's in text. Yeah, yeah, it's text. So I don't read it, but they do throw that in there, in there to let you know that yes, he does have different voices, and it does make sense. Otherwise, Commissioner Gordon isn't stupid, and goes, "Oh, you're Bruce Wayne." That's just yeah. how it is. But how is the voice in this one? I don't. I don't like his voice. Yeah, at all. me either. <laughs> but I, it, it's I, better than it is in The Dark Knight. No, 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 very much so. It gets worse throughout it, it the... It gets worse. I, I think it's comforting to know uh, that uh, Bruce Wayne is a huge Cookie Monster fan. <laughs> <laughs> and he decided to bring that to the world. It gets worse as they give Batman more lines. Yeah, that's yeah. At the start of this film, he has no lines as Batman. So it's just one word, I, comments. I, yeah, I think he should have had a menacing, gruff voice. But Batman also needs a more conversational voice for those sequences with oh, Gordon and yes, some of that stuff. Because just about yeah, to say it's that. like, Gordon, if you need me. It's like, just settle down, man. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, he should, he should have toned it right down for those scenes. And when he gets angry and like, you know, like, you know, where is he and stuff yeah. like that when he's Swear getting like, me. yeah, 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 yeah. It works better for me in those scenes. It's it's the quieter scenes where I have the bigger issue. It's yeah. the kind of voice that you used to put on a kid when you're playing with your figures. Be like, I'm gonna get you, <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I, I think it's I think it's just great that Bruce Wayne is a huge fan of Doctor Claw from Inspector Gadget. <laughs> How dare you? That's so, true. Yeah. And he's brought that to the world. So well, he's Frank he, Welker, right? It, it was Frank voice. Welker. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Next time, Gadget. What an iconic voice that he, was. He um he does become Batman Gadget later on. He does become Batman Gadget. Whilst we're knocking Batman. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I don't really like the look of him in in this one. In all of them, I, in I, any Batman film, in the Nolan ones, I don't think they've ever got it right. I mean, I, I guess it's a different take, and it's a real world, and he's, he's using real armor, and and it's all practical. But you put that next to Keaton in Tim Burton's Batman, that fucking costume looks awesome, and it still looks awesome. And I just think it just. I don't know. It just never well, really comes together in these films. Well, I was going to speak about that a bit later too, but this one's all black. Yeah, the Tim Burton Batman one had yellow, right? Yeah. Plus, I think uh, the sorry the the jawline and uh, of of Bale, uh, it just doesn't work. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a small helmety kind of cow too, isn't it? It's not as it's not that big elongated kind of menacing cow that he's worn before. It's, it's a little bit more similar shape to the cloth one worn by Adam West. Like it's a yeah, it's a it's, skull hugging kind of helmet kind of thing whereas yeah that Burton one that we love so much it's mm. just so bigger ears and this massive kind of head that just wow yeah yeah movement was impossible in yeah, you could, yeah. <laughs> Michael Keaton could've, couldn't look left or right no, without moving his shoulders you. but I just don't like Batman armor Batman for me is in spandex he's human and he doesn't need armor because he doesn't put himself in a position to need armor because he knows he's human so if he gets shot armor's not going to stop you or stop anything he'll die so he takes the time to take him out individually or he's that quick and good that he, he just doesn't need armor yeah that's he, cool oh, that's, that, that hasn't been done really has it does no. it does it get any better in the follow-up films or do, do they pretty much stay with this design i can't remember no they loosen it up in the second one because he does actually go to lucius fox and say look the suit's great but i need more mobility and lucius does say look we've got this suit you get more mobility but you give up protection so you're now going to have open sort of side flank areas or in under joining armor plates which then does come into play the joker stabs him well i think we can all just be thankful bros that uh, they didn't add nipples like they did in batman <laughs> and robin so uh yes yeah, so. or george clooney 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's point. it. Michael Caine plays Alfred Bros. Now, Michael Caine, he, he's so good, this guy. He steals every scene he's in. Oh, he's and that's, not, that's not a bad thing. That's not saying he's taking away from whoever he's working alongside, particularly Bale or anything like that. Well, it but gives this, Bale this guy, a break, doesn't it? Yeah. It means this sure thing does. doesn't have to be about Bruce Wayne or Batman all of a sudden, and we're yep. getting some depth. What's great about Alfred in this film is he's not subservient. He's not a servant. Yeah. He's not... And, you know, I love... Is it Michael Goff plays Alfred yeah. in the Burton ones? He's great, but he's just a butler. Um, and he's, he's always there for him and supporting him in, in, a, in that way. But And it re, it's revealed more in subsequent uh, Nolan films. But Alfred's so much more than just a butler. And he's thinking and suggesting ideas. He gets on board with the Batman concept and he helps build the Batman concept. He's basically the Bill Finger to, um, to Bruce Wayne's Bob Kane. And he's just, he's, it's a great character. And having someone like Michael Caine, when he was first cast, I was not happy because I was used to that kind of stuffy English style voice, whereas Caine's got his kind of uh, Cockney accent. Yeah. I thought it was going to cheapen the role a little bit, having a Cockney butler and kind of, a, but he, he obviously ditches the accent that we know and love from Michael Caine. He kind of alters it a little bit and he's phenomenal. Since Alfred's sense of duty and loyalty towards Bruce Wayne reminded him of the comradeship that exists in the military. So Michael Caine based his character's voice on that of a colonel he knew when he was in the army as an 18-year-old. There you go. Yeah, perfect. Now, Bros, imagine this film uh, with uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins playing um, Alfred. Was he the first in line or was he just considered? I don't know, actually. I'm assuming he's... Bruce Wayne, I'm not sure if you should go out tonight in that outfit. (laughs) It's certainly very dark. I'd rather Martin Short. (laughs) <laughs> Martin Short. Oh, sorry. No, you mean Martin Sheen. <laughs> Martin Sheen. <laughs> Martin Sheen. <laughs> God, Martin Short again, completely different. <laughs> the, <laughs> it's the old song and dance, Alfred. I meant to use paprika. What do you think of uh, Michael Caine in this one, Andrew? Uh, I just, I'm disappointed no one's actually done the uh, the impersonation of, of Michael Caine. Oh, we're leaving that up to you, my friend. Well, I can't. I can't. It's too much pressure. <laughs> so I thought you would have dropped a price. No, yes. I stay away from those. Yeah. You can't do it? I can do it, but I'm not going to. You're not going to. <laughs> the uh, definitive Michael Caine impersonation, you need to watch uh, The Trip, the trip the, with every Steve time. Coogan and nice. uh, Rob Brydon. Rob Brydon. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely they, classic scene. They both do a different Michael Caine impersonation, but both are brilliant. Moving along, bros, uh, very interested to see what you think of this gentleman's work here. Liam Neeson plays Descartes in this film. So now, uh, after my recent Liam Neeson outburst on yes. this pod- podcast, I was watching his performance very carefully. I bet uh, you were. And for those people that still defend Liam Neeson and think he is actually a decent actor, just watch how quick Nolan cuts around his performance in this, how many times they use uh, they overdub his dialogue from a previous uh, uh, shot. There's, the perfect example is in the prison sequence when he, we first meet him. At one point, Liam Neeson is just delivering that horrible exposition that he's got to try and get out of his mouth, and as poorly as Liam, only Liam, Liam Neeson can do. Oh, wow. And there's Nolan cutting around like a maniac trying to keep it interesting. At one point, Raja Ghul just starts walking away from Bruce Wayne to the door, and you can hear the exposition being played over the top of that and it's just cut 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 how do we keep it interesting and how do we make it not look like Liam Neeson's as shit as he actually is wow I am coming down harsh on Liam Neeson he's, he's a serviceable actor he's fine he's good and in this Nolan makes him look great that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> so it's a compliment at the end of all that <laughs> But I did find just, enough evidence here to satisfy my um, ne- negativity. Yeah. <laughs> I just like what, what's that? I'd have him around for dinner, but you know, no, oh, he's yeah, a top bloke. Stand Six more. years before this, he was in the Phantom Menace, bros, and like you know, like the difference between Phantom Menace and this film is like phenomenally huge. I guess that's why he was cast because Rush Ghul has a lot of exposition in this film, and that's all the prequels for Star Wars were was ex- exposition. So it's the perfect that's true. casting. Yeah, that's very true. But um, I guess the main difference he's he's the main villain of this film, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. It's sort of disguised for a lot of the film, uh, but he's the main... That twist is, is also what's great about this film, too. Um, did, actually, I'll ask you guys now, did you guys pick that twist the first time you watched it, or did, you just, did the film just reveal it to you as it was supposed to? Just watched it, and it revealed it, and I thought, oh, that is awesome. Yeah, I, I forgot about him, you know, once yeah. the film got kicked in, it just, you just I thought his about part that. was done. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it, and I didn't think, because he wasn't bi- that big enough an actor that you're thinking, oh, he's going to come back. It just seemed like it was a nice little cameo for And he was always Liam. Descartes. And, and, it's, then, and he gets some great scenes early on, so it seems like enough for a cameo. Yeah. Like, there's such meaty... That scene on the ice and the stuff in the, in the, the Timber Castle house thing on yeah. the hill. To, yeah, it's, you, you, it's enough to forget about him and just move on. He's yeah. such a different villain as well, from, particularly on the follow-on from some of the previous Batman films leading yeah. up to this as well. Oh, for like, sure. Um, Very understated and... Yeah, he's... Um, 
is sort of more of an agent of supreme order rather than even something like the Joker in the second one where it's more supreme chaos, if that sort of makes yeah, sense. Exactly. You know what I mean? Like, he, he's, he's got a cause that he's trying to stick to. Yeah. Katie Holmes plays Rachel Dawes. Unlike most characters in the film, Rachel Dawes, played by Katie Holmes, doesn't exist in Batman. Is that nope. right, Roddy? Uh, or any other DC comic series. She was created by director Christopher Nolan and screenwriter David S. Goya. Yeah. We, was, we were talking about this just before we started recording about whether or not Katie Holmes is the weak link in this movie, right? Oh, yes, she is. Oh, just like I, that, Andrew? I'm here to tell <laughs> you, like to answer that for okay. you. We, we were more of the opinion that she does the, be- the best that she can with the, the material that she's got, but look at the, the cast around her, who she's surrounded by. Yeah. But do you agree with that, Andrew, or do you really think that this is a, a miscast and that the character... I think the character is much better in The Dark Knight when um, Maggie Gyllenhaal takes over. Uh, much more interesting. Much better portrayal, I think. But you don't... Also better written, I think, by then. Yeah. Yeah. You so know, what do you think? Uh, but since you bring that up, I think it's I think it's the writing. Like, Because uh, I, I didn't really like Maggie Gyllenhaal in the second one. I, I, thought, oh, okay. well, I thought her performance was really irritating. I just thought the way she played it was just really jarring to me. But maybe it's the writing, you know, because the, both the females in, in these films are found just really, they, they are, have been a weak link. I mean, they haven't got a very strong, strong character to work with anyway, but I don't know, just both of them just didn't, didn't click at all. I, um, I think there's a few missed opportunities with this character. I think there's no reason why she couldn't have been in charge instead of having her boss. Was it the DA or whatever the boss yeah. is? Why not make her a stronger character? Why not make her in charge? And why not have her assistant, the one that disappears at the docks? I never really felt the authority with her. Never felt the, oh, no. and I never felt the, uh, you know, that, that passion that we keep being told about that she's there to, to help the little guy or save people, or like she, you don't feel that she's on the same level as where Bruce Wayne's coming from, for example. Yeah, I, I just get the feeling that this she's there because of studio pressure to have a female lead. Like, is that? You're just kind of expecting to go back to the pier with Dawson and, you know, into the sunset. <laughs> it just doesn't seem like Batman's her world. I don't mind her simply because I have a little bit of a crush on Joey Potter. So, you know. <laughs> well, <that's> just, <laughs> it's a but conflict it, of interest it there, is, it, uh, is, Rod. it is. It is. Yeah. It's both it's, childhood things coming together. It's that you yeah. don't go. Sarah McLaughlin, you know, all comes together. I think it's, I think it's a real shame. <laughs> it's a shame. That this is this is such a weak link. In I don't this film. I don't think it's weak enough to upset my enjoyment of this film. And it no, me either. It wasn't just, the first time. It, just, it could be amazing if they had a strong female character and it was you know well acted. I think it would be you know something something of note. Yeah, I um, do think this movie could have used a few spinning newspapers. Just to show you what's going So, you know, <laughs> just Rachel Dawes. Time lapses. Yeah, or- Rachel Dawes, per- person of the people, saves yeah. Yeah. Um, the narrow. His Girl Friday makes good. That's yeah. it, yeah, stuff like that. Or there's a scene where. Damn good headlines, guys. There's a We're scene when here. they're in Arkham Asylum. They're putting all the poison into the water. Batman rocks up. Cillian Murphy's uh, Scarecrow, spoiler. Notice he's there and he goes, all right, Rad, he's here, let's fight. Sends all the henchmen off to get him, and then the henchmen go, oh, I don't know, I've heard he can fly. I heard he could disappear. And I'm just like, oh, that's a bit forced. Like, that's the first time I've heard it all movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that, but spinning headline. Yeah. Just, you know. More spinning headlines, says Rod. Ha- having said that, I did get a bit of a chuckle with the, uh, is it on page eight in the newspaper when Batman yeah. gets, when yeah. it says, Drunken dr- billionaire drunk burns billionaire. down his home. Like, that, that, that did make me chuckle. As in, like, you know, also, <laughs> hides Rachel Ghoul. Yeah. So all of a sudden, now Rachel Will had nothing to do with anything because he's a. No one knows about Rachel. That's the other thing. He's international and thousands of years old, but he's a secret organization. So shh. And how good's his reveal at the party? You know, yeah, it's I know, just, he's just spoken awesome. off frame, and it just yeah, yeah it's really good. Fantastic yeah, that, that was fantastic. Uh, Gary Oldman plays uh, Jim Gordon. Oh the- my. God, Gary Oldman plays Jim Gordon like a mofo. One of the few uncorrupted Gotham City police officers who was on duty the night of the murder of Bruce's parents and in this way shares a special bond with the adult Bruce and thus with Batman. It's interesting with these films because Goyer yep. and John Nolan have always told these stories that Christopher Nolan never wanted to come back and do another one. That he did this Batman Begins and he never wanted to do a second film. And so then they tell these stories about how Jonathan Nolan and Goya would then talk Christopher Nolan into doing the next film. That famously would go to his house and stand in the garage for hours at a time and break down the story and explain why it's worth doing another film. But the interesting thing is, did he cast Gary Oldman as Gordon, not expecting to use him a second time? I mean, he's so brilliant in this role. And if he wasn't intending on doing a sequel, how much help did he give himself by casting Oldman? Like, how much more can you do with that character when you've got an actor like Oldman in that spot? He's, he's, yeah. he's incredible. Yeah, he's, he, 
it's also interesting seeing Oldman in a in a role uh, where he is like you know the supportive good guy. Yeah, yeah. Sort yeah. of in a supporting role. Like and he doesn't even, used to see him as these crazy villains and oh, stuff. Absolutely. You know? like, he's not so. even. He's not. He doesn't even look like Oldman. Like he just yeah, the hairline and oh, the, yeah. just, he looks like Jim Gordon. Yeah. yeah, he's the greatest Jim Gordon in the history of Batman. Like, yeah, he is so good. Just, in this. It just makes you miss his. You know, his screen presence because he's just yeah. not done enough, and it's just such a damn good actor. Oh, I hope yeah. that's his choice. Well, yeah, maybe he's so good. Yeah. yeah, I love that scene where he gets. In, we'll talk about it later, but when he gets into the tumbler, that's that's, yeah. that's a great sequence. Yeah, some yeah. great stuff. I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think yeah. Oldman nails it, and the yeah. young young uh, Gordon to old Gordon to everything in between. He's just phenomenal. Cillian Murphy plays a Doctor Jonathan Crane or Scarecrow, who you think is going to be the main villain of the film. It doesn't turn out that way, of course. Spoilers, everybody. But um, <laughs> director Nolan is reputed to have been so fascinated with Cillian Murphy's bright blue eyes that he kept trying to find reasons or ways to have Crane remove his glasses and when you think about that as well he really does take them off a number of times in becomes dialogue a, scenes in this yeah, film yeah it becomes a character trait of his I suppose yeah yeah uh, do you guys yeah what do you guys think of Cillian Murphy in, in this role yeah I think uh, like all of the, the Batman films of Nolan's the villain storyline always gets squashed in there a little bit and I feel like he's his character is squashed in a bit and it's just not enough to kind of make it really powerful but what you know, Cillian Murphy does with it is great. Well, he's pretty intense. He's a loose bit of a he's loose. He doesn't loose do much, but he's just got this this creepy presence, and he's yeah, he's really unsettling to to be around. I love the way uh, when they're in the warehouse, the way he says simply, "He's here." Who? The Batman. You know, <laughs> the way he says it is like really unique. I mean, one of the things I love about Nolan's Bat universe is the way he uses the villains and the characters he doesn't have to give everyone an origin story even though Scarecrow kind of gets an origin story anyway but he's already kind of on his way to being the Scarecrow I, I kind of like the idea that you know Gotham City is populated with all these weird and wacky and, and messed up kind of characters that are in the comic books there's another little character mentioned for about two seconds uh, Zaz uh, who's Mr. a Zaz. he's a knife wielding uh, homicidal maniac who's uh, who's mentioned in the, in the plot for this and we see him later on and he's a big deal in the comic books he, he appears in, in a few issues He's an important part of the uh, Nightfall uh, storyline, at least early on, his little his little appearance there. I mean, no one wants to watch a two-hour film where Scarecrow's the main villain. Like, yeah. He's just not good enough. He's not an A-list villain. But to use him in a, in a supporting role, I think, is genius on Nolan's part. And it helps us forget about Rush Ghoul for a while and, and think about someone else who's freaky. Killian Murphy, or Cillian Murphy, however you want to pronounce it, is having a ball. How much fun is he having in this film? Yeah, he's loving it. Um, I've been watching Peaky Blinders as well, and he's the star of that series. Oh, yeah. And he is incredible in that as well. Yeah. But, and, villain, and villainous and evil and, and so forth. But in this, you just see he's having just the most fun you can have on a film set, just, yeah, playing around. I love it. Tom Wilkinson plays uh, Carmine Falcone, the most powerful mafia boss in Gotham who shares a prison cell with Joe Chill after Chill murdered both of Bruce's parents. Tom Wilkinson, yeah, uh, I guess he's he's pretty good. I just wish that um, we don't get the full Monty from him, do we? I like I like I like English Tom Wilkinson. Um, I, I got to find his American take yeah. is a little his little, accent in this film yeah. is just a little forced. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit hard to take, but he's great. He's charismatic anyway. Though. Oh no, he's he, great. He I, I a, love him. A, he's a great actor. Yeah. I just I just think that, yeah, I, I think like. It takes a while for you to click with it. Like it's just the first scene is just, uh, uh, but then you're just gonna go with it. But when he when he gets some some of the uh, the the gas and he goes crazy you know, yeah. that's when you're seeing some of his best work there yeah <laughs> <laughs> just gas him next time <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Morgan Freeman plays Lucius Fox now this is a character who didn't have a big presence in, well he's never been featured in any of the previous Batman movies no nope. but the comics a little bit yeah, yeah but the movies really pushed him to the forefront yeah this one has and it's great yeah. he in the comics he runs Wayne Enterprises or Industries or whatever they call it because Bruce Wayne's not there. He's asleep during the day and he's Batman during the night. So Lucius Fox does the day-to-day business of it and Bruce Wayne lets him run it. Doesn't know Bruce Wayne's Batman in the comics, but again, if he really pressed himself and thought about it, he probably wouldn't be surprised. But Yeah. I mean, one of the key things about this film when it comes back to the writing of the script is very early on they obviously decided that Bruce Wayne is Batman isn't the biggest secret. So Lucius Fox knows and Alfred knows and uh, in the end Rachel Dawes knows and I think that helps 
make that character that little bit more believable that he's got those people that do know that he trusts that are, that are helping him along the way. Morgan Freeman's Lucius Fox is incredible. All those little wry kind of sly looks to Bruce Wayne as if I know what you're doing and, you know, I saw the Tumblr on the news and, I you know, yeah. I, I know it's you and it really helps to kind of ground it. The performances by those actors and then the way they're written, it, it, it's great. It, it ingrains this Batman story in as much reality as possible and the fact that they all know about that and they, they you know, on it. Yeah, uh, it and it's only feel- a small select p- group of people, Rajah Ghul knows as well, but it's believable because in the real world, 99% of people wouldn't know that Bruce Wayne's Batman or 99.999%, but that little 0.111.001% give it a believability they're like of course he needs support from these people and of course uh, Morgan Freeman himself I mean just as charming as ever uh, this is definitely one of his his better performances of the last uh, 10-15 years for sure I mean Morgan Freeman's at the point now where he I don't know you get the feeling sometimes he doesn't even show up but uh, he's very very much uh, uh, integral in this film he narrates penguins like a mofo doesn't he though (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) penguins look a bit like bats (laughs) if you squint the little kid with the funny looking face he's in <laughs> Game of Thrones Narrows. is that right Jack Gleason. there you go Jack Gleason with the piercing blue eyes yeah. he's related to the scarecrow maybe yeah the, so he's uh, just like the little voice of the kids I guess isn't he in this film that's pretty much what he plays it's a weird little moment on the on the, on the the stairwell when he throws him his periscopy thing and kids yep. won't believe it what does it matter you don't want the kids to do you want I don't know yeah, oh, that's I, a yep. handy periscope. You want to keep that? Yeah, yeah, that looked yeah. expensive. That was yeah. night vision and, and everything. I'm pretty sure it's labelled Wayne Enterprises. <laughs> <laughs> if lost, return to Bruce Wayne. At <laughs> Wayne Manor, bitches. <laughs> now, Bruce, we, also, we often talk about uh, star cars here on uh, Real Chat. Oh, One of yes. our favourite things to talk about. The Tumblr. The new yeah. Batmobile in this film. It's controversial, the Tumblr, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I've always liked it because I, I like it because of the way it's introduced and its backstory. It was a, a military vehicle that was obviously failed as a military vehicle. It's in storage. Not many people know about it. It's kind of top secret. And then you paint it black and it's a Batmobile. So I like that element. Visually, I don't love it, but... I, I like the, the way they've built it into the story and the fabric of the reality. I think that works really well. Uh, it's, it's, it hasn't got the flair of a 60s Batmobile or a Burton Batmobile. Uh, yeah. But thank goodness it's not as ridiculous as a Schumacher Batmobile. So oh, yeah. for me, it's probably my third favourite Batmobile from the from the films, film and TV. Actually, probably fourth because the animated series Batmobile is fantastic. Yeah, that was so it's probably good. fourth for me out of, out of the TV film universe. Rod's not a huge... I'm not a huge fan of the Tumblr. It's... Thoughts? It's just not stealth. It's not sleek. Batman's not... He's subtle. Yeah. He's, he's not robust. He doesn't break things. He he doesn't put himself in situations where he has to bust out. Yeah. So he, he doesn't need a car that's going to break down walls because yeah, he doesn't because get in those situations. He disappears. That's why he was with Ray al Ghul learning to be a ninja. Let's get the biggest, loudest car I've got. <laughs> Can I just tank? And yeah, it is loud, isn't bang. it? <laughs> like, let's... And then he just yeah. shuts the lights off and the cops are next to him going, oh, I can't see it. Is that stealth mode? You yeah, just turn the lights off? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you should have like a Datsun or something like that. Just, you know, something indiscreet. Something just, innocuous. Yeah. yeah. He's got a Mazda 3. I mean, that's, that's Batman, really. <laughs> everywhere, no, everywhere. <laughs> well, that's it. He doesn't have a fast car. He just has lots of cars scouted everywhere. How do you get there so quick? And exactly. he parked and jumped over and went that That's way. the Bat Yaris. <laughs> he's a car off. similar to the Gadget Mobile. You know, you like can transform turn into, into a van, into a sports car when required. He needs like a yeah. Bat Valet. If you're just going to run around. <laughs> well, Alfred does that every so often. I'm trying to dust the... Ah, oh, forget it. Well, the first uh, Batmobile in the comics was... Uh, oh, it's a 39 Cord or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's like a limousine with a big bat on the front. Yeah, with a big bat shield. <laughs> subtle. Yeah, subtle. very subtle. What about yeah. your thoughts on the Tumblr, Andrew? Uh, I, I kind of, I didn't mind it. I just, you know, it was, not, it was refreshing because, you know, they've all, all been so sleek and, and these long kind of black phalluses, really. Uh, but, <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> this was just like a big chunky bulldozer of a thing and I just it was just different I just thought oh you know they're trying this is a different film you know we're in a different world and different rules and uh, why not you know bit of destruction so favourite scenes in the films guys the whole f- start where he's in the um, I'm tipping it's Tibetan jail beating up all those blokes climbing the mountain keeping the, the flower. Um, flower and yeah going back to the textures of the film like just the way they zoom in on his rags and his woolen clothes and you can just like you, you just oh no that's soft and warm 
Oh, that's all right. I, I'd climb the mountain in those. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little details. Yeah, just like, like well, I did anyway. I'm like, hey, good work. Is your apartment cold? Or? <laughs> <laughs> it is. You have to buy one of those electric blanket ponchos. I'm so lonely. So, so in other words, the whole um, sort of origin part of this yeah, film yeah, is, I thought is your favourite part. The, the, uh, up until I thought the little kid that played Bruce Wayne was a bitch. I wanted to slap him, but... Um, <laughs> I think it's Gus Lewis, I think was his name. Yeah, I, like, I'm sure he's good at what he does. He, I just didn't like him there. And for me, Thomas Wayne is Tom Selleck. He's met his dad. He's a big, tall, broad-shouldered, mustachioed man because Bruce Wayne is big and broad and yeah, dark-haired. Right. Like, does a good job. I liked how he was a caring father, and that's where, you know, that shone through at the end in Bruce Wayne. But... He, he looks more like Tom Selleck for me. So other than the Bruce Wayne origin as a kid, him trying to learn to fight and be Batman, I thought was rad. Yep. Bruce? Jeez, I don't know now. This, this it's a hard thing. film it's to just pinpoint film. particular scenes, yeah. I find. The, oh yeah, I definitely do because everything's so intricate in terms of it's all relating back. Like, I love... I love the sequences with Bruce Wayne, the playboy, and the, the, you know him playing that role and how ridiculous it is. And you know, uh, Alfred I, says to him, "You should do things like playboys do, like buy things that aren't for sale." And then we see him in the hotel and he get, buys get the in hotel. Swimming pools with a couple it, of girls, two like. European models in the swimming pool, <laughs> and then you know back out to the sports car. And but I guess it, it comes back to Bale as well, just that he can play all the different faces of Batman and he does them all so well. The other stuff I really like, which is kind of. I guess a bit boring in the scheme of things, but all the stuff with Wayne Enterprises I love and the way that Bale's Bruce Wayne handles all that with a kind of airy kind of arrogance, uh, but also kind of playing up that playboy element and that last sequence where Rutger Hauer comes in or Earl comes in and, you know, it's gone public as I know, but I own the business and I, you know, but all that yeah. stuff's really nice. That, that's Christian Bale there. Yeah, that's yeah, Patrick that's, Bale's, that's, ba- that's right. Yeah. That's Bale's it's a little word. bit complicated. I love yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, some yeah. nice callbacks there as well. Well, yeah. that's one thing. I've, I got a new job. That's it's yours. Thing with Didn't you get that Batman? With that the... gets forgotten too. That he is a super genius. Like, being a Batman comic fan, it's always thrown around the comic shops and comic cons and whatever when you talk comic books. It's like, I like Batman because he's the character that every man can be because he's human it's like yeah if you're a billionaire super genius super <laughs> athletic ridiculous martial artist yeah of course anyone can be no you can't moron yeah but i like how they get all those elements into this bat like they they don't drop an element he's super smart that's why princeton like he likes princeton princeton didn't like him but it didn't matter he didn't need it because he was like he's yeah. just i think uh, michael keaton's batman is a little bit too reclusive yeah and so it's nice to bring that out yeah. Yeah, in, in Bruce Wayne. Um, not that I think it's Michael Keaton's fault or Tim no. Burton's, but yeah, you don't want a reclusive Bruce Wayne. Andrew? Andrew, yeah. Um, I, for me, it's just a small scene, but it's really powerful. And it's when uh, uh, Scarecrow sets Batman on fire and he just plummets out the window. You just don't have that kind of scene happen in a Batman film. Like, you don't get to see him get his ass kicked that much. And, you know, just you could see the pain that he's in just trying to get out of there and quickly, and then he's on the roof, and he's just all singed and fucked up. And, and then the next morning, he's just covered in bruises. It just really emphasises the humanity of, of Batman and Bruce Wayne. I just thought it's really powerful. There's a little bit of trivia here from uh, Batman Begins. Uh, when Christian Bale and Liam Neeson were fighting on the frozen lake, they could hear the ice cracking beneath their feet. The next day, the lake was completely melted. Wow. <laughs> yeah, how's that for timing? That's nuts. <laughs> Sensational. Can't they actually did it on real ice. Yeah, I know. I just thought yeah, it would be like a set Yeah, but when you watch the film as well, you know, I don't think they've, they've created that in a studio or an effect sort of show wow. or anything like that. So it's risky. Yeah. yeah. Due to his part in The Machinist in 2004, so the year before this, Christian Bale was vastly underweight, about 120 pounds on his six-foot frame when he was under consideration for this part as Bruce Wayne. After being cast, he was told to become as big as you could by Christopher Nolan. Bale underwent a six-month dietary and exercise routine and ended up weighing about 220 pounds, about 40 pounds above his normal weight. It was decided that Bale had become too large. (laughs) Friends of his on the film's crew dubbed him as Fat Man, and he quickly shed about 20 pounds to have a leaner, more muscular frame. Bale described the experience as an unbearable physical ordeal. But I tell you what, he puts himself through this stuff all the time, Christian Bale, because he just just transforms constantly. And I I think... 
he suffered for it because I think in these days he just does not look very healthy at all. He, um, he recently gets- turned down a role because they wanted him to put on 40 pounds and he said, well, I think those days are kind of done. You think he's had enough. But he just yeah. looks withered these days. He yeah. looks really yeah. frail and, and really gone, anorexic. Really, yep. Well, We've got a personal trainer here. Yes, we we do. So, like, so, so, so is that is what Bale Roddy, is doing, in, in particularly in that uh, lead up to playing Batman here? Like, well, it kind of starts a bit before then because, like, he lost it in the Machinist, but he was buff and fit in American Psycho. Yeah, yeah. So he was almost arguably the prime body shape and size for his body shape in American Psycho. He loses it for um, Machinist. the Machinist. Then gains it, but he also he's also said too that when Christopher Nolan said I need you to get as big as you can, he had a massive workout weight regime, but he wasn't well what's called clean bulking. So he wasn't eating good foods excessively. He was eating big carb foods like pastas and donuts and just eating as much as he can of anything to get the bulk on. So it wasn't really, and you can see it while he's. Um, in training with Rachel Gould at the start. Like, he's that big, almost 50s bodybuilder look. Like, he was just round and barrelly, and then as the movie goes on, you see him sort of thin up. I wouldn't recommend it uh, to anyone, that weight mm, loss and mm. shift and then put it back so you're on not, and off. You're not and surprised he's looking a little... little I'm not surprised these days. that he looks yeah. a bit tired and sore yeah. and so, he's not keen like, to do that it That must put huge trauma on your body forever. Yeah. Oh, oof, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. It would. It'd, it'd affect it later on. I'm not saying it'd be um, like it's not terminal. It's not deadly. It's not yeah. issues. But yeah, he will. He, yeah, your body doesn't just bounce back. So Christian, eat something, man. Yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're listening, <laughs> just eat a balanced diet and exercise regularly, mate, and chill out. Please, you know? please. Stop, exactly. stop all this rapid weight gain. Contrary to the previous Batman films, in which the Batcave was realised as a combination of a live set and matte paintings done by either hand or computer, no visual effects were used in this film to show the Batcave. The entire Batcave is instead a massive full-scale set, and boy, does it look impressive. I want to play there. (laughs) (laughs) At the time of of this film's release, Forbes magazine did a breakdown of how much it would actually cost to become Batman. The magazine estimated that total expenses in US dollars would be around three. 3.5 3.5 million. Stillable? <laughs> when you're Bruce Wayne? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super smart. This is the first live action appearance by Scarecrow, a villain dating back to Batman's earliest comic stories. While considered for the 1960s TV series, he was never used and was meant to be the main villain in the fifth Burton Schumacher film that was thankfully shelved, bros. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's just the nature of these films where they just try and. You know, if, if it's a weaker villain, they cram more villains in for some reason and instead of fleshing it out or creating a villain again. Or, or lazy writing. Or two lazy fa- writing. Two-Face is strong enough for his own movie. Yeah, but then they always ditch him. But in this, I think it's good to use him as a supporting character. I think it's really good. Mm. In a 2012 interview, Christopher Nolan admitted that he invented the line... Rub your chest. Your arms will take care of themselves. Spoken by Henry Descartes <laughs> after Bruce Wayne falls into the frozen lake. And that has no scientific basis, adding that he imagined Boy Scouts everywhere freezing to death because they took the advice literally thanks to Nissan's <laughs> convincing delivery. I've used it every winter since. But anyway, <laughs> oh, your, arms, your are, arms have dropped it, off. But it makes sense because you're using your arms to rub your chest. So the blood's going to flow through them anyway, and that's going to warm it, them up. It's totally convincing. When you yeah. hear the line, you're like, you know, yeah. Well, the other yeah, thing too is the... Uh, and Rachel Gould said it, man. <laughs> and when you're cold, your body starts conserving your warm blood and energy to your key organs. So your chest, once you get that warm again, then the, the rest will take care of themselves. Yeah, the, the extremities do get cut off. So. Yeah. Yep. yeah. This is the only Batman movie, both live action and animated, to celebrate Bruce Wayne's birthday. He turns 30. You can see a big 30 in the background when Rachel comes to give him his present. I was it, curious about the birthday itself as well. Like, what's the significance of, of putting that in there? In this it's, it's an event to have it. Like, have Bruce, to get guests at, together. Like, yeah, yeah, at Wayne Manor that's not it's a It's for Raja, yeah, Raja Ghul's reveal. It, it, well, they used a charity gala for Harvey Dent in the second one. Yeah. And I guess the other thing, yes. too, is having it as his birthday and then kicking all these guests out is more severe and more interesting than it just being that's a gala or something. Yep. Yep. Yeah. What, what is the, just quickly, what is the deal with the arrowhead? Is that just the biggest load of shit in this film? They find the arrowhead in the well, and then she gives it back as a present. Like, who gives a shit about the arrowhead? <laughs> yeah. I couldn't. Get, and what the hell is an arrowhead doing in the middle of the UK? It's a bloody American, Native American arrowhead. Yeah, but 
I know, it's set in America. It was just shot in the UK. Yeah. I find the arrowhead really just pointless in this yeah, film. The, it doesn't it's have like any... A, it was taken out of the script or something. It yeah. must have been something to it. It doesn't have anywhere near as much power emotionally as I think they think it did. Yeah. Or yeah. wanted it to. Or wanted it to. Because it was the bonding thing. Because he gives it yeah, back know, after. Yeah. And Maybe yeah, it's just yeah. that Katie Holmes is holding it and that's why it didn't have any... <laughs> 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 She's drained all the maybe, significance may, out of that. May, may, maybe she gave it back going, you're going to have to give this to Maggie Gyllenhaal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out, child. When she takes over. <laughs> this is the first Batman movie in which Gotham City scenes were filmed on location in an actual city as opposed to on a set or images via stock footage. While the on-location scenes were filmed in Chicago, Gotham City of the comics is based on New York City. And in fact, the name Gotham is a colloquial for New York. That is correct. Yep. Yeah, no, that, that's Gotham's awesome. a, a nickname for New York. Yep. The, uh, because of the Gothic uh, architecture, or the original Gothic architecture. Yeah. The aerial shots in this, though, I think are New York. I don't think they're Chicago. But the, all the ground-level shots and the car chases and all those bits are definitely Chicago. When I was in Chicago a few years ago for the first time, uh, we were just kind of walking around looking for a particular building um, that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright had designed. And we stepped out onto from like a little uh, walkway kind of mall between two buildings stepped out into these really narrow streets with high buildings and I kind of freaked out because it's one of those occasions where it's like this is really familiar but I've never been here kind of moments almost like a deja vu but it was stronger than that Yeah. and it took me a while to work out but it was the street they used in the second Batman film when they're honouring the police and so they've got all the police lined up and Joker's up oh, yeah. you're doing the sniper yeah, right. stuff so it's the same street where they had all that set up and it was really freaky because it was so familiar to me to be in that environment but in this film uh, you'll see locations that were used in The Fugitive that were used in Blues Brothers um, there's a whole bunch of Chicago set films that uh, car chasers take part in and so on and so forth so I almost want to get the clips of the car chase and play the Blues Brothers music over the top of it to see if it works but nice. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a YouTube video of that bro it should be, it it should should be. be. Maybe get onto it somebody yeah. somebody <laughs> else yo YouTube do that <laughs> do that Instances with just one or two bats in the shot, such as the single bat gone astray inside Wayne's mansion, uses real bats, but each scene with a flock of them obviously had to be done using CG, um, since it was decided it was decided it was too difficult to control that many bats at once. Surprise, surprise. Who would have thought uh, yeah, No, exactly. but Batman had that thing in his boot, oh, and they yeah. controlled them. <laughs> Lucky <laughs> air. <laughs> Something interesting as well, Bruce Wayne does not appear in full Batman costume until just over an hour into the running time of this film. Which is a well, good move. Like, good move. Yeah, yeah, it is a good move, isn't mm. it? Yeah, yeah it's, re- it's great. With this film, Christopher Nolan uh, would begin the practice of showing all of his movie's credits at the end of the movie, including the movie's title. Now, I don't mind movie credits that do this, right? But I always like the name of the film to be at the start. Yeah. Now, I, know, I understand what he's going for and why he likes this style, because it gives it a particular feel. The title of the film, though, I'm a real advocate for putting it at the start of the film. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because it's not easy to get the credits put at the end. You have to go to all the different guilds because there are guild regulations on when titles need to appear. So it it takes a huge amount of negotiations to go to all the different technical guilds to make sure that everyone's okay with the, the titles appearing at the end and it's happened in a couple of instances and, and more recently I think a few more times but yeah it's not easy it's not easy to get it there I love the old days when all the titles were at the start of the film and there was nothing at the end like I yeah. love those old 40s and 50s films where you you know you see 30 names on the cards or whatever and then they zip them out of the way and like bang we're into the film don't have to worry about yeah. it ever again I think uh, a reason I do like the long end credits though is because it really gives a nice showcase to the score if you really like yeah, the score true. as well that's so true. it gives a lot of time for it yeah, yeah, and yeah, if yeah. it's Marvel it gives you something to stay around to watch it does in between them you'll like this uh, little bit of trivia here uh, Roddy uh, the Joker playing card presented to Batman at the end of the film is a replica of the Joker card from the 1989 graphic novel Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison and Dave McKean yeah. it carries an evidence label this label reads that the officer who discovered it was Jay Kerr one of the Joker's favourite aliases Joker in the comic books yes yeah, I, so what do you think of that little touch I like it I knew it was a copy but I wasn't sure what issue or what comic it was a copy from whether it was arkham asylum or just he does have a joker playing card hanging in the back cave a giant one which has been redone by many artists then there was interesting because there were rumors after this film that the joker wasn't going to be the star of the next film or the, ne- the villain yeah, there was the too i remember there were a lot of talk about it oh no it's not the joker that was just to tease people and it's going to be this character or they, they did well keeping that a secret and then thank fuck doing... it wasn't the penguin that's for sure right? <laughs> <laughs> i love the penguin he's underappreciated and underused not 
Furton's Penguin. That's, that was an embarrassment. <laughs> Bruce, let's talk about the uh, the DVD and Blu-ray releases of Batman Begins. Let's get into it. Because I remember one of our very first discussions about uh, Home Theatre, Bruce, uh, you brought up this Blu-ray. Yeah, it's interesting. I watched the DVD for this viewing and I, I borrowed it off my brother, actually, because I don't have it. But I, I saw the Blu-ray of this many years ago. Uh, when did it come out? 2008, I think. The Blu-ray came out 2008. 2008. Yeah. But the DVD came out 2005. And if we all go back to 2008, Blu-ray was still very new in 2008. There are only a few available. This was one of the early ones released, probably one of the first 50 films released on Blu-ray or whatever. So it was still a big novelty or it was a big transition. It was very exciting Blu-ray. Uh, I'd seen, I think, one other Blu-ray up until this point, which I really enjoyed, whatever it was. like It was a great uh, release. With this one, this is the first time I looked at Blu-ray and thought maybe it's not going to work. Just the picture quality for me didn't work at all. I could notice I noticed transitions between location filming and, and um, sound studio filming in within scenes. The lighting didn't quite transfer over, and I'm sure you're about to tell us the technical reasons for that. But it really disappointed me. I only watched the first half hour of it and I had to turn it off because it was just ruining the whole film for me so the the blu-ray for this i did not did not enjoy the first time but there's reasons why uh, yeah. two years before in 2006 do you remember there was a format that competed with blu-ray called hd dvd i do yeah. were there 10 titles released on that in the yeah, end and batman what? begins was one of them oh there you go right. so it was uh, the fifth element the 2006 hd dvd didn't have a great transfer apparently right. it was the early days of, of high definition movies at yeah. home so from what i've been out to gather on one of the flagship Warner releases on HDVD, Batman Begins, was delayed on Blu-ray to better capitalize on interactive features, right? Because they were experimenting with what Blu-ray could do. Yep. Being the early days, they were like, how can we sell it? It's not really that different from DVD, really, for the general market. Yeah. What do we do? So they were trying to create these interactive features. Unfortunately, Warner appeared to make no effort to capitalize on Blu-ray's overarching feature, which is superior capacity. Yeah. The bit rates of the Blu-ray are no better than that of the HD DVD, which is very experimental. As you said, one of the 10 titles or something like that. That means the picture and sound are also held back by the HD DVD and appear to have been sourced from the same transfer. Right, so the video and audio are not really. It's not bad, bro. So I guess that by this stage, you're just expecting a lot because we've seen superior titles. I was watching it also on a, right. a very new, very large yeah. screen, which probably didn't help so, either. But. So it's not bad at all. But Batman Begins is not up to reference quality by any accurate assessment. Uh, the most frustrating part of this observation is not just waiting more than a year for no significant bitrate improvement over the HD DVD, but it, when you're comparing Batman Begins to a six-minute prologue of The Dark Knight, which was put yeah, on there because right. that's why this Blu-ray came out. Because and the, the six Dark minute, Knight was on the way. The six-minute prologue was majority of the IMAX camera footage from The Dark Knight too, wasn't it? it and it looks, if you have a look at it... Spectacular. It yeah, but it's on the disc. Yeah. So when you're using the comparison, you're like, hang on a second, isn't this what Blu-ray is supposed to look yeah. like? I mean, for those, <laughs> right. for those yeah. that don't quite understand the difference too, a standard DVD is about, I don't know, four and a half, five gig of data and the standard blu-ray is about 50 gig of data yeah so you can fit a lot more data on there in the first place which means the transfers can be a larger file size and so then obviously the picture quality is going to be that much better That's, yeah yeah and like the video the audio appears to be a straight port from the hdvd as well so why again this isn't that bad or offensive it is similar to a cd resolution right so Warner, again, does not capitalize on the capacity or the capability of the Blu-ray advantages. So it's not poor. It's just not great reference material by yeah. today's standards. So I don't know if the average person would purchase it, maybe even listening to us, bro, so yeah. and go, you know what? That's, that's really as bad as they're saying it is. Well, you watched the Blu-ray for today? Yeah. Did you find it? Disappointing to watch. Like, was the it- smaller the screen, the better it was. Surprise, surprise. Well, there you go, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So I, I, I saw some of the film on the smaller screen and some of it on my um, 55. Yep. And um, it was a lot more evident to me. Yeah, I watched but it. I was I, aware of it. I watched the Blu-ray on a 50-inch and massive, and I was quite close to it because it was yeah. a mate's house with a small lounge room. But, uh, and yeah, I noticed it. Did you watch the Blu-ray? Yeah. yeah. Well, did I, you notice any of this? I didn't. I, until you've mentioned it now, I was thinking it wasn't amazing. I didn't, didn't find it really breathtaking. It's still like, better than DVD. Oh, yeah. But like The Dark Knight. I, I, you know, when you watch that, oh, that, that is that's stunning. reference, reference quality. Like you just, you're just yeah. aware of how good that is. But and this, I didn't think about. It. Have you got the Blu-ray? Or you got the DVD? No, I've just got DVDs. The, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this film is overdue for a proper Blu-ray release, full, full quality, and, and reference quality would be amazing. And a commentary would be nice, which yeah, we don't yeah. have. 
What are you saying? We don't have to talk about it. No, saying which we don't have. No, th- th- there's no straight audio commentary for any for on any of the Batman releases. Yeah, but they did create something for the, this Blu-ray release. Yeah, what which do they call trying this? To a BD, BD Live or something? Or? Something like that. There's a there is official name for it. Get well, BD it's, Wong to talk about. That's right. <laughs> it's live. That's it's picture in picture. And it's why we had to wait so long for this Blu-ray release. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nolan so, said that when the DVD was released that he wouldn't do a commentary. And he was one of those directors that didn't believe in it. And I, I even think with this, I haven't seen it because I don't have the Blu-ray, but I get the feeling that it might be other footage of Nolan talking about the film that they, they put in picture, not necessarily him watching it for the release. No, it's... It's like, definitely it's, shot for the release? No, it's, it's a lot of interview footage that's yeah. been shot for other things and been put into it. So, so that explains like, it. He still like hasn't done a commentary. It's those commentaries where they take all the audio from from interview yeah. segments and put it together with relevance to what's going on on the yeah. screen. I mean, it's, it's got a good lineup. Nolan's there, Bale, Michael Caine, Gary Oldman, uh, Goya's interviewed, uh, Emma Thomas, the producer, uh, and among others. There's plenty of people talking about it, but uh, yeah, it's not a straight commentary as such. Um, yeah. And I, I can't find a lot of information about it online either. It's not talked about. People aren't really that I impressed. Know. The only... I, <laughs> Found a few things like that I established who was in it, so I could find that information. Like the third option when I googled was how do I turn it off? <laughs> like a Yahoo Answers I or something. <laughs> I, I, I think video and video. I don't think that people are uh, very interested. I mean, I think no. with an audio commentary is the fact that like you know you you just the audio you just you're just hearing it. Yeah. When you're having to watch something in a little screen beside the main feature, yeah. I don't think this is something that the average person is really like warmed I don't to think it. anyone's interested in it at all. Just so, sitting around a TV talking about it like it's yeah, yeah it's are you guys saying Back to the Future 2 is wrong with the multiple screens on the big <laughs> screen in the lounge people don't want picture in picture really. that's the that's the future we deserve not the that's one right. we no. yeah <laughs> but um, yeah look look, I, I sampled it a little bit bros um, but yep. uh, again I mean it's just it's just I, I'm not surprised this you feature you found it more is, distracting yeah I'm not surprised this feature hasn't taken off you know, it's so. not as good as the silhouettes during the Ghostbusters commentary. Oh, that's great. Really great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there are a lot of little 15-minute uh, long featurettes on the Blu-ray and DVD Yeah, they've done well. a solid job with the featurettes, but they're yeah. not dissimilar to what was released in the Deluxe Edition DVD in 2005. But they did a great job with them. There are some great featurettes on here. Genesis of the Bat, Batman The Journey Begins, Path to Discovery, Saving Gotham City, Shaping Mind and Body, Gotham City Rises, Cape and Cow, Batman the Tumblr. So it's just little... And they're all about 14 or 15 minutes long. Yeah, they're good lengths. So it's, yeah. it's good to have, you know, as bonus material. But, um, yeah, so... I think the Blu-ray's worth picking up. You maybe want to adjust yeah, it. We really have bagged it, but it's not that bad. Yeah. It's just that... And what like, is it at the moment? $9? dollars dirt cheap, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 under 10 bucks. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fan of the film, it's not like you... Three for you, 20? You wouldn't bypass the Blu-ray based on the yeah. fact that... It's if you just, don't own it, then just pick up the Blu-ray. But I, yeah. it's just underwhelming, unfortunately, and it'd be nice... I wonder if any of the box sets they did a new Blu-ray. Probably not. It'd I don't be nice think so. To, it'd be nice to do a decent Blu-ray release. No, nah, we'd know about it if, they, if there was yeah. a better transfer. Yeah. Faux show. Andrew, the uh, the soundtrack or the score to uh, Batman Begins um, was done by Hans Zimmer and James Newton Howard. This is the first film we've looked at on uh, Real Chat with a composer collaboration. Mm. So um, what are your uh, your thoughts on this score? And also the influence it's had on cinema over the last uh, 11 years since this film came out. Yeah, well, and I think this is the first Hans Zimmer film we might have. I think done. it is actually and surprising. He's a man that uh, that, that cut, cuts the room in half uh, because he's just he has changed film scoring. I think it's evident that he has had a huge part to play in what is now considered the the way to go with film scores. So, um, you know, people will say that. They would hate him for that because the people would think that they've lost lost that lost that craftsmanship of the orchestra and you know the old fashioned style of uh, of music that's scored in films and it's you know now just done in a in a studio with a keyboard, uh, which is very simplistic. But yeah, so he, he divides people. But you know I'm a fan of his work. I think he does a great job. You know it could be a little bit repetitive sometimes, and you know he's, he's the go-to guy at the moment, isn't he? Oh, he does everything. He does everything. <laughs> he's, 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 he's literally that. So yeah, he and James. Newton Howard collaborated on this score, and and uh, it's seamless. And these two very strong uh, musicians coming together, and you really can't tell who, who takes over from the other. Uh, I can a little bit. Uh, all the action stuff is Hans Zimmer, without a doubt, right? When you got those little personal moments, and when it gets a little bit quiet, you go into the story of Bruce Wayne and stuff like that. Yeah, knowing what James Newton Howard's stuff sounds like as well, he he's definitely on all over those scenes. So yeah. it seems to be depending on what the the mood of the scene is calling for. 
Well, it's, uh, it's hard with Hans Zimmer because part of the controversy with him is that he has a company called Media Vision, I think. Yep. And that's like a house of film composers. So it's like a like a frat house, if you will, of just like all these, <laughs> these up and coming film composers who he gets to assist yes. him. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, not to take away from him, but a lot of his scores have a lot of other people's work in it. And yep. it's very hard to just put the badge of Hans Zimmer on on something when it's a lot of these underlings that are just like, give me, give me something to do, Hans. Give me something. <laughs> yeah. um, and they do lots of great work for him. So, and this one is a perfect example. There's like, um, there's like five guys, you know, all up. There's like um, Raman Javadi, who has now become the composer for Game of Thrones. Right. So he's gone on to bigger and better things. He had a, quite a big part to play in this score. Uh, another guy named Mel Wesson, did lots of the atmospheric, you know, really kind of uh, interesting textures and, and sound design. Another interesting fact with this score is that, that they actually create sound design for the, the film. So it's not just music, it's actual, yeah, sound effects. So especially with the uh, Scarecrow when he does his freaky stuff. Yeah, right. Of, they create a lot of sound for that. So yeah, highly collaborative score, but... Apparently must- Zimmer asked Nolan if he could invite uh, James Newton Howard on because they'd want to collaborate. Yeah, that's right. So that's it's right. not like... It was like Nolan said, I want you two to come work you together. You can't do this on your own. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, they, I find they, that really interesting because you don't, this doesn't happen that much. Well, I apparently. Like the idea that Nolan turned around and just went, stop, collaborate and listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll just go with that. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's almost never happens. I think it happened back in the 40s with a film called The Egyptian, yep. which had Bernard Herrmann and Alfred Newman collaborating. Oh, so wow. it's oh, nice. that far back. Um, Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine. <laughs> I know. <That's... laughs> Who would have thought? With those ears, I guess, it's uh, you know, only something he'd be a musician. But um, yeah, so anyway, to cut a long story short, the, the score, um, it's again divides because it's, you know, everyone's used to that classic, you know, march, uh, superhero march, and the classic orchestra playing, very stirring themes. And this is very minimalist. It's it's very simple in a, in a way. I mean, it's, it's effectively a two note theme for Batman. Yes. Yeah, the, Which is staggering, really. There are, there, are two, there are two little motifs in the score that are used frequently, right? Yeah. There's what I refer to as the cape motif or bat's wings, yes. which is used a lot, particularly at the very beginning. It's used throughout the score as well, which is like, you know, the flapping sort of sound that goes up and down. And then, of course, throughout even, yeah, the, the entire Dark Knight trilogy, there's the, as you said, two notes. Yeah. It's, you know, like a strings and brass, one tone, louder tone. Yeah. <laughs> which will obviously play in the background here, bros. Uh, but, um, yeah, it is so effective, though. So simple. <laughs> well, yeah, like, uh, yeah. when I walked out of the film, I was disappointed with the score because I'm, right. I'm so conditioned to that old-school kind of Danny Elfman type of score, which I love. What about now, though? Now I love it. I think That's it's what I was saying. This is what genius. most people find with this score. People yeah. were underwhelmed I back mean, in 2005. I, I really miss that Danny Elfman theme. theme. Like, that is incredible theme that yep. Burton used it so well the Batman animated series used it even better it, when I saw this film I was I was disappointed that they ditched that theme and fair enough to ditch it. it's new composers new film new director whatever but I mean that'll always that's the most iconic Batman theme for me now even eclipsing the 60s blues based uh, and a Batman theme but yeah I mean it's it's a it's a it's a great score that serves the film and serves the plot God, I miss that, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look at that film, bros. Yeah, the uh, animated. I, I have the uh, first Batman, Burton Batman soundtrack, just the orchestral, the, the, score. the score on vinyl. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah. I have the soundtrack on vinyl. It's not as cool. No, the Bat Dance was great, though. Come on. <laughs> I was waiting for Prince to pop up in this film. <laughs> Disappointing. Yeah. No one else said um, But yeah, as you, as you were saying as well, just how staggeringly influential this, this type of score is. Uh, you know, it's now used in everything. It, is, um, it started here, didn't it? It was these oh, guys. Yeah. They started it. Yeah. And, yeah, we'll get to the end. I'm going to talk a bit about what my love-hate relationship with Batman Begins as a whole, right? Yeah. And a lot of it is just to do with the fact of what it started and the fact that so many things have tried to copy it. Uh, but the music, it, yeah, I think it's gotten better. I think it, maybe it's because we're, we're more used to it now and we're, we've accepted that it's no longer the sound of the 89 Batman or anything like that. Yeah. But, yeah, I think that this score is, I think it's, this score is great, personally. I yeah, think I think yeah, I think it uh, it's probably the better of the three, uh, just because it it's fresher and it has a lot of ideas going on. 
there's actually in the release of the soundtrack, it, it really doesn't even scratch the surface of of, no. of what's what's out there anyway. I mean, not officially, but apparently they recorded two hours and twenty minutes of music, wow. which is a lot more than the, f- the running, running time of the film. Yep. But yeah, 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 but the score obviously just CD length that it's only it's like twelve tracks, maybe yeah. sixty minutes or something 60 or like that. Sixty seventy minutes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and apparently, I've seen it. You can get a seventy-four track version, or it's on it's on the net. I don't think it's officially released. It's definitely not officially released, but yeah, it's everything. Um, oh, so there's a bootleg. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. It's just like I 74 tracks, right. and it. it's got like unused <laughs> unused tracks, deleted stuff, and a lot of really strong content like the um, the car chase, which isn't in the score, which is a great piece of music. Nice. Um, so, yeah, it is out there. I didn't I know say. that. Thanks, Andrew. Well, I think it's <laughs> on the deep here web. For. You know, on the dark web. On the dark web. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. No, I, didn't know, I didn't know about a bootleg release, actually. Yeah. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know if you can actually tangibly get it. Well, maybe you can. I don't know. But no, 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 no. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but the, the official release, yeah, 12-track score album. Yeah, um, and, and look, it's great. I mean, it covers a lot of a lot of the, the solid moments in the film. And there's a little Easter egg on the track listings as well. I hear that the... Well, first of all, that the 12 names of the tracks are all different types of bats. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Right? Quite but nice. what's, what's the little Easter egg with the names as well? Oh, just the letter of each it's the start of each name spells out Batman <laughs> yeah. that's cool too yeah. Yeah. Little, little, little touches there yeah. but um, yeah but like yeah great great score recommended for uh, for fans of uh, this type of film music and everything so. oh definitely yeah it's very impressive yep go get it the <laughs> thanks, official Andrew. version yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that Andrew uh, Bruce uh, collectibles from uh, Batman Begins yeah this is getting into an epic episode it turns out so I'm just going to skip over this a little bit quickly uh, Mattel released the official 6 inch toys they're, they're pretty average oh I was going to read out this list because this is one of my most biggest pet hates when it comes to action figures so one of the things they do is obviously Batman's the key character in the release of these action figures right everyone wants a Batman figure but when I was a kid all I wanted was the Batman that looked like the one in the film but then they go and release all the Variants. One's orange and one's blue and one's green and one has a gun that shoots a cable and one has a gun that shoots an arrow and for some reason this is an underwater Batman and this one's a... So this is the list of Batmans that were released for the Batman Begins and you can just tell me where they appear in the film because I'm sure they don't. Battle Gear Batman, Zipline Attack Batman, Power Punch Batman, Ninja Brewster Batman, Bomb Blast Batman, Rotoblade Batman, Rapid Fire Batman, Attack Net Batman, Battle Gear Batman, Exosuit Batman, Hover Claw Batman, Night Staff Batman, Dual Blade Brewster Batman, Speed Sled Batman, Rapid Fire Batman, and Tumblr. Oh no, that's the Tumblr Batman bill. So all those Batman were released. They're all different ridiculous colors, and who gives a shit about any of them except the one that looks like? There are two Batman figures I always wanted the one that looked like the Batman from the film, and the one where you could get Bruce Wayne and dress him up as Batman like. He can like he does in the, that's all I want. All those right. other Batmans yeah. are superfluous, but they existed. One thing with the figures is the six inch figures, they came out before the movie, they were that tight on keeping the Rachel Ghoul reveal that Rachel Ghoul was modeled after Ken Wanatabe, not Liam Neeson, and he came out and Liam Ducard. Neeson was Ducard. Yeah, yep. that is correct. Clever, yeah, spot on. So, yeah, I mean, the, the Mattel film figures are pretty average, they're pretty generic, broad Mattel figures. There was a Medicom Toys 12 inch. Batman, and it's just a bit ordinary looking. So it's a 12 inch Batman figure, as we, we've come to know and love. To celebrate 10 years of Batman Begins, NECA, uh, who do a great job normally with their figures, have released a one quarter scale, 18 inch tall Batman. Wow. From Batman Begins. And it's, it's just come out January this year. And it's, no, it's still not great looking for a $200 investment. It's, and I don't know why you'd need an 18-inch tall Batman figure, but Rod's making a note of that now. <laughs> uh, that being said, uh, Hot Toys come to the rescue. Uh, they released uh, a Batman and Bruce Wayne figure. So basically it's a, you can change the head and it's Bruce Wayne, put the other head on and it's Batman. Uh, the, the sculpt of um, Christian Bale looks incredible, as they all do. Just oh, I, phenomenal. I was on the website today and I was just looking at the close-up picture of the sculpt and it just blows your mind. It looks like... A especially the way they shoot it, but it looks like the actor. It's spot on. They also released a two-pack of Scarecrow and then the Demon Batman, so the version of Batman when he's all scared and so forth. That's quite a cool little two-pack. Uh, the Scarecrow figure doesn't look like the mask comes off, so maybe they didn't get Cillian Murphy's likeness. Or, maybe. Or maybe, I don't know, or maybe it does come off and it's just a trick. The other thing they released, not for this film, but obviously it goes with this film, they released a 1-6 scale tumbler. Oh, nice. So as ridiculous it is to get my head around a 1-6 scale DeLorean and where that would fit in my apartment, imagine if you had the equal uh, accurately scaled version of the Tumblr sitting next to it. Wow. 
I also found out they did a one six scale of Burton's Batmobile, which would be kind of phenomenal. That would be because awesome. the Michael Keaton Batman. There'd be more of an appeal for that one. I there think. is more appeal there, but yeah, yeah the tumbler. I mean, that'd be massive. It's insane. But uh, the hot toys are the pick of the bunch. So if you're going to invest in anything, there's also uh, various replicas of the cowl that you can pick up online. I saw them on eBay. I saw them on Etsy, and I saw them on a collector's site. But don't buy them through a collector's site. There are plenty of people making them that look amazing um, and will give you a better deal. But uh, there are some great replicas of the cows if you're doing any cosplay. So uh, dig those up. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Just quickly in regards to the uh, awards for uh, Batman Begins, its most notable nomination at the... Well, it's its only Oscar nomination. <laughs> Best Achievement in Cinematography for good old Wally Fister, Andrew. Ah, uh, yes. So, uh... <laughs> wow, the year was a blister for old Wally Fister, wasn't it? <laughs> If it was Willy Fister, that'd be even worse. <laughs> that would, uh, yes. that would hurt. We've got no Golden Globes and nominations, Bruce, but the good old uh, Satins nice. come to our rescue, as they always I do. Love the uh, it won the Satin Award for Best Fantasy Film, Best Actor, Christian Bale, and Best Writing to Christopher Nolan and David S. Goya. Nominated for Best Supporting Actor to who, Bruce? Michael Caine. No. Your uh, favorite, who's your favourite? Uh, was it uh, Morgan Freeman? Rooker Hauer? Liam Neeson, bro. Uh, uh, Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes. <laughs> Katie Holmes. <laughs> Jack Gleason. <laughs> Robbed. Ken Best Wanafab. Supporting Actress, Katie Holmes. What? <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Best Director, Christopher Nolan. Best Music, James Newton Howard and Hans Zimmer. Best Costume to Lindy Hemming. And Best Special Effects to the FX team. Razzie Awards 2006, bros. Nominated... Worst Supporting Actress, Ooh. Katie Holmes. Oh, I wouldn't go that far. That's a go. fair pool to swim in. No comment. That's maybe a little harsh, but uh, it's on there, bro, so we had to mention it. There you go. The Rotten Tomatoes website certifies Batman Begins Fresh with a score of 85%. That's two, nice. That's 225 good. positive, 41 negative, And it has an IMDb score of 8.3 out of 10. So very high with the fans, bro. Oh, that's good. What they found when this film worked and the, and the franchise worked was that like, oh, well, let's just make everything dark and gritty. Uh, audiences love it. And for something like Superman, it just simply doesn't work. No, it and, doesn't work. And I've seen it and a lot of the films I've seen, which is why I'm not a big fan of this type of film, is because of the fact that like, you know, they're all trying to do what this film did and hope for a repeat Yeah, no, but that's, that's just short, short-sightedness, narrow-mindedness. Lazy writing. Uh, lazy and derivative Well, that's writing. my problem then. Yeah. Well, the executives are saying, do that with this because it makes money and it's that and, simple. And the people love well, it. Well, I don't think Zack yeah. Snyder's had an original idea since he dropped the K off his first name. So... <laughs> There's a good chance that he just went, oh, I'll just do what Nolan did. Uh, I'm giving you Nolan Superman, and everyone's gone, yeah. yeah Nolan so was supposed to be an executive producer on that film, too, and I'm not sure if he was in the end. Oh, he's got a producer credit. He's got a producer yeah, credit. No, he, yeah, he's all over that one. That's yeah. why Superman yeah. is oh, he, he wrote the script, I think, I think, too. yeah, no, yeah. he's, he's but, got quite a bit to do with it. Will you uh, do us the uh, the honour of coming on The Man of Steel? <laughs> <laughs> the honour? Oh, yeah. I, I no, I really to... want your opinion yeah, on, no, uh, I, I, on I, that I, film. I so. think enough time's passed <laughs> since I've seen it. You'll be angry. Look, when you rewatch that one, look, it's just a shame that like the formula works so well here. So they thought that they put it into everything, and that's what people love. You know, I don't know. It, it's it's not a fabricated formula as such. It's just going back to the source material. I mean, this is the kind of Batman film Batman fans wanted when Burton released his, and Burton did a great job going from sixties to nineties Batman. Yep. Um, and then the link between you know Burton and, and Nolan is obvious, but. This is the Batman we've always wanted. This, sure. is, this is the Batman we've read in the comics. Mm -hmm. Superman's never been like this. So why would you try and Batman up Superman? It's a ridiculous idea. That's my point. It's, I mean, you can Batman up Iron Man and it yeah. works quite well. But yeah. mind you, Iron Man's still bright. He's still light. He's still... Yeah. There's not a lot of nighttime shots in no, there's Iron not. Man. I mean, the other thing about Superman, this is how desperate they are. What have they done to try and make Superman relevant? Add Batman. Yeah, I know. So let's just wrap this up with our traditional five-star review system per guest, bros. And traditionally... Who are we starting with, bro? On your left, <laughs> with Andrew. Oh, <laughs> it's a tradition. Guys. Tradition. Thanks. Look, yeah, this one is my favourite of Nolan's films. Uh, I think he nails the uh, the tone and the overall structure of the story. Um, it doesn't get bogged down in heavy-handedness like the other two do. Uh, the other two kind of give me a headache when I walk out of them. Um, they're kind of depressing and uh, <laughs> and just too much. Whereas this is actually a fun film. It's it's a comic book film and uh, you know as it should be so you know it's a just a light breezy action film and i think it's just incredibly clever in how it invigorates the the series christian bale for the, the reasons we mentioned fantastic batman and bruce wayne the music the photography 
it's a cinematic experience, which I would highly recommend. Having said that, though, it's no Superman. So I'm going to give it 3.5. Three and a half. And recommended? Highly. Great work. Mm. Thanks, Andrew. Bros. I'm going to give four out of five, straight out of the gate. Uh, it's a great film. It's the Batman film we've waited for. It's what Tim Burton wanted to give us. It's the link between Adam West and, and uh, Michael Keaton. It's the logical pro- progression after Michael Keaton. Christian Bale's perfectly cast. It's a great film. Check it out. Good stuff, Bros. Roddy. I'm four to four and a half out of five. It's the comic book movie I always wanted. It's the Batman I always wanted to see. I'd like a bit more detective work, but that's what I like in Batman more than his gadgets. But um, highly recommend it. If you're going to watch a Batman film, watch this one and then work your way forward and work your way back and don't worry about Schumacher's. Good stuff. Thanks a lot, Roddy. Um, just, yeah, I'll just wrap it up just quickly. Um, part of what makes Batman Begin succeed is the way it focuses on Bruce Wayne's psychology and motivations. The film carefully and chronologically documents how he goes from frightened and orphaned to the ruthless caped crusader. Yeah, there are a few amateur-like moments in the film. Uh, Dr. Crane's delivery was sometimes a bit off, as was Dawes, of course, who's you know definitely the weakest link. But with Bale's solid portrayal of Bruce and Nolan's ability to pull the entire story together... The newest saga of Batman is off to, you know, a riveting start. And like you, Andrew, I also do think that this is actually the strongest of the three. Most people say the second one. Nah, this uh, one, definitely. Yeah. Throw in some fine effects, excellent sets of Gotham City and dark cinematography, and Batman Begins may be one of my favorite superhero films of all time, I reckon. Oh, it's in my top five. Yeah, yeah so, Easily. yeah, so yeah, very highly recommended, guys, and uh, in the big lead up to the... Batman Superman overload this year, bro. So I think it's a good uh, chance to look at this series, definitely. So Absolutely. And yeah. we've got Suicide Squad later in the year. Definitely, uh, yeah. Which be hopefully exciting. It's in the trailer. Uh, I'm staying away from trailers. I'm good using work. the Stu method. I haven't seen the yep. second trailer for Batman Superman. I haven't seen any of the trailers for the Suicide Squad. I just yep. want the film to do its job. Fantastic. Uh, but I recommend that to everybody. Star Wars was magnificent because I avoided trailers. So. That's the spirit. Good stuff, bro. So, yeah, yeah thanks very much, guys. Thanks for coming thanks. along and talking thanks Batman, Roddy. That's right. I'll and, be back. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks Roddy. Thanks, Andrew. And, uh, thanks, Adam. See you Thank soon, you all. Cheers. Bye-bye. Ciao. You can keep in touch with us here at Real Chat by visiting realchat.com.au. Check us out on Twitter at Real Chat Podcast, Instagram, real underscore chat underscore podcast, and we're on YouTube, Real Chat Podcast. Surprise, surprise. And track us down on Facebook. You can hit iTunes for new episodes and check out some of our old episodes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>